Hello and welcome to GameSec. This week we're going to do the first in what we hope becomes many episodes dedicated to the subject, games that never left Japan. That's exactly right. These are games that should have gotten a wider release than they did, and frankly just because they deserve it. They're awesome. Yeah, yeah, they are. So what game that didn't get a Western release do you have in store for us first, Dave? Well, I'm going to talk about Golden Axe 3. Ooh. Now you would think Golden Axe 3 would be a no-brainer for Sega to release the game outside of Japan and Asia, being how popular the Golden Axe series was. But Sega was pretty good at making bad choices. Yeah, don't look at me like that. You won't get any argument here. Oh man, I wanted an argument. Anyways, I'm a fan of the Golden Axe series, so I didn't have to think twice about importing this one. Definitely a good finale to the golden days of Golden Axe. This version has everything you want and more, and some things which you'd like to see more of. Along with the tried and true gameplay, Sega gives you four playable characters which is up from three in previous games. The game has branching paths which adds to the game's diversity. This version has good music, but it's not as great as music from parts one and two. The magic spells are okay, nothing inspired or grand that will make you scream AWESOME! The graphics are good, but seem a little flat in some areas. The graphics are definitely very, very low budget, and flat is indeed a great way to describe the character animation here. And finally, why, Sega, is the dwarf not playable? He's one of the best characters and you don't let me select him? This upset me very much. Huh, come on, at least you can control a really crappy panther character instead. Actually, don't. He's pretty useless, but the other three characters are pretty good, though. Sorry, Joe, that's no consolation for me. Anyways, this is a very good addition to your import library. Yeah, I think this game gets kind of a bad rap here and there, but it is really fun. Alright Joe, what's the first game that you're going to take a look at? Well, since the Genesis is still plugged in, might as well take a look at Glay Lancer. What the hell is Glay? Ah, Glay Lancer for the Mega Drive. I wonder what they really meant to call this game as Glay Lancer just sounds kind of broken. Well Joe, maybe it's uh, Grey Lancer. Or how about Grey Rancer? Well, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Glay Lancer is a horizontal shooter from Messiah. At first it might look like your run-of-the-mill shoot 'em up and in some ways it definitely is. But what I like about this game is it gives you many different choices on how to handle your options that float around your ship. I personally like the shadow mode which the options follow you as if you were pulling them along with a string. Also nice is that if you hold down the C button the options freeze in their position and this can be very helpful. Anyway, the game opens with a four and a half minute cutscene to set up the story for the events that are about to follow, and there's this moon language again, so I have no clue what the story's about. Ah, uh, who cares anyways? Yeah, anyway, the gameplay feels very smooth, and although you do get set back when you die, you usually don't get set back too far, and also the bosses are very, very easy. Still, it'll take you a while to reach the end of this game, as there are 11 stages total. The graphics in this game are generally pretty good, there's some nice parallax scrolling effects and overall it's quite pleasing to look at. The music is fantastic for the most part, the tunes really pump you up early on in the game. Yeah, some of the best game music out there is found in this game. The sound effects are all good as well, the only thing here that sounds bad are the voices. It sounds like they hired a robot with the electro laryngitis to talk to you in this game. Stick to it and believe in your power. I don't know why this game never saw the light of day outside of Japan at the time, it's really a shame. It's much better than a lot of the westernized crap that we were seeing on the Genesis. These days a real copy of the game commands quite a high price. It's available on the Wii Virtual Console if you don't mind emulating it though. So that's 
Glalancer for you. Go out and get it right away if you're able to. So Dave, your turn. What game's it gonna be? Well, Joe, unhook the Genesis over there. Oh. Plug in the PlayStation, PS1, whatever. One with a mod chip or whatever damn device you use to play import games, because we're gonna take a look at Hermy Hopperhead. Ooh, let's hop to it. Hermy Hopperhead is a nice little platformer that came out at the beginning of the PS1's life. And therefore it fell under Sony's no 2D policy they had for the early US market and wasn't released here. Yeah, and that really sucked because you know what, I had to make a call on importing this game by what I saw in the back of GameFan in the ad for Game Cave or, or was it Tronix? I took the chance and I'm glad I did because it turned out to be a fun game. As you can see, the game has very bright and attractive graphics. The main character looks like a total poser though. Throughout the game, there are eggs for you to collect. You can have up to three at one time. These are your helpers and your life bar also. While you have control of them, they will follow you and you can take one hit from enemies and not die. Once you release them, they will kill enemies and collect stars, but this will leave you vulnerable and you will die if an enemy hits you. You can also use these eggs at certain points to make platforms so you can reach out of place areas. Collecting stars through the level is important as these are what you use to power up your eggs to make them hatch and become stronger. The control is great and the levels are well thought out. The music is okay. There's not a lot of variety to the music and it has a very jazzy, almost Dixieland sound to it. I got tired of the music in this game really fast. Yeah, it's definitely not that great. A great import game and I'm glad I took the chance. You know, it's too bad that Sony didn't want a lot of variety in their lineup early on, Dave. Games like that definitely should have been released here. Oh, I agree totally. I mean, 2D was still the hot and happening thing in the gaming world. And it was, yeah. Sony totally cut it out for some stupid reason. But, you know, that's a thing of the past and we're moved on by now. So, what, uh, what game are you taking a look at now, Joe? I'm thinking of slashing into Bulk Slash for the Sega Saturn. Bulk Slash is a surprisingly good game for the Saturn by Hudson Soft. Weirdly, the front cover is glued to the plastic. No, I didn't get some kind of knockoff or some kind of used version. This is how it actually is, so be really careful not to crack the case for this game. Anyway, you play as a mech that can run around on the ground destroying things, and you can also transform into a flying thingamabob which can also shoot down and destroy things. I love thingamabobs. Not too many games have thingamabobs, which is sad. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of Ranger X for the Genesis for some weird reason. It also kind of reminds me of Metalhead on the 32X. Anyway, moving on. You can find an anime girl who is very, very vocal about what you're doing and gives you hints on what to do next, or at least I presume that's what she's babbling about. As if a woman yelling at you will make you work harder, or even better for that matter. Your goal is to locate and destroy several different enemy targets all over the map. Why? I have no idea, but that's what the game wants you to do, so you've got to do it. After all of the targets have been destroyed, you get to fight the boss of the level. Who would have thought? This usually works best if you're in your flying mode. And obviously, as the levels progress, uh, targets get tougher to locate and harder to destroy. The graphics are fairly good for a Saturn 3D game, and the music is excellent. Ah, uh, Joe, these graphics haven't aged well, just like a lot of Polygon games back in the day. Still though, I'm amazed that this game did not come out in the US being as it was a free roaming 3D game, it had a good presentation, and it was a really fun game to play. Hudson Soft brought over other stuff like Dungeon Explorer and Lords of Thunder, why didn't they bring over this? My guess is that they simply didn't want to translate all the voices. So if any video game developers in the 1990s are watching this episode through their future vision device, please take note that if you want your game to have as wide an audience as possible, don't put so many voices in it unless it's a huge budget title. Wow, Joe, Bulk Slash looks like a cool game, and you know what? The funny thing is, I've never even heard of it before. You know, that's okay, nothing wrong with that. Anyway, one more game you get to choose in this episode. Which game made the cut? I'm gonna choose... 
Cosmo Gang the video. The video? All right, I'll power up the VCR. Cosmo Gang the video. Strange title, I know, but what do you expect from a game not released outside of Japan? Well, actually, it was released in the US, but only in the arcades. Surprisingly, the title remained the same. The Cosmo Gang are the bad guys, and this game is their video. This premise is far too complex for simple-minded Americans to handle, so Namco didn't bother to release it here. Who the hell is Namco to call me simple-minded? Anyways, as many of you know, Galaga is a game that made Namco a household name. So it's not surprising that Galaga would have some offshoots. I originally illegally downloaded this game and played it on a Super Nintendo emulator, and I immediately knew that I had to go out and get the real thing, so I did. Seeing my copy is how Dave discovered this game. I'm not gonna lie, that's true, Joe. So Cosmo Gang is basically Galaga with a few tweaks here and there. The game plays exactly like Galaga. Obviously, the main differences are graphical. Everything now has a cute look to it. There are six worlds and each has four levels. At the end of the fourth level, there is a mini game where you have to stop six enemies from stealing a certain object. According to the arcade version, they're trying to steal energy here. Okay, you guys, steal energy. Also included is a final boss for the whole game. This is a great game to have as it can be played and beaten in under an hour. It also has a fun two-player mode, which is the best way to play. You always say that playing two players is the best as if you have friends or something. But yes, this is a great game. All right, Joe, one game left. What's it gonna be? Well, you know, Dave, I'm still in a Saturn mood, so I thought I would throw in Battle Grega. Battle Greg? Why is Greg going to battle? Okay, enough <laughs> with the puns. People are getting sick of them. I know. I frankly am getting sick of them, too, so <laughs> let's get to it. Battle Garega is a vertical shoot 'em up for the Saturn by Rising. Um, Joe, I think we clarified that it's called Shmup. <laughs> it was originally an arcade game, and I assume this has been ported over nearly perfect. One of the first things you'll notice about Battle Garega is the silky smooth control you have over your plane. There's nothing complex going on here, and no speed adjustments to worry about, and it just works right. The next thing you'll notice is how crazy the action in this game is. When things blow up, they send shrapnel flying everywhere. It's actually quite impressive to look at. But don't look too long or it will be your death. You can choose from four different airplanes, each with their own unique firepower, bombs, and speed. You can eventually unlock four uh, alternative planes that are more science fiction-y or fantasy-like. These are pretty cool and help give the game a bit more personality. The graphics are great, it's 2D all the way, not a single polygon lives in this game. The music is also pretty cool for the most part. You can choose between original and arranged tracks. The arranged tunes are pretty cool to listen to, but overall I think I like the originals better. It should be noted that like all other Rising games I've played, this game is insanely easy. Don't let the frenetic on-screen action fool you. I'm playing it on the hardest difficulty level here. Yeah, and he's playing with one eye closed, too. Still, that shouldn't keep people from getting this game if you can't. I can think of two reasons that this game wasn't released outside of Japan. Number one, it's a 2D game. Companies back then were allergic to releasing 2D games outside of Japan. Number two, it's a shooter. Since it was both 2D and a shooter, companies likely felt that it wasn't advanced enough to be released here and that players would reject it because it looked and felt too old. The sad thing is, they were probably right. Players likely would have rejected it. Oh well, that's marketing for you, I guess. But still, this is a great game. There you have it, six games of goodness which all deserved wider audiences. That's exactly right. And what games would you guys like to see that never got released outside of Japan? If we have it, we'll cover it. Yeah, hopefully. Anyway, we'll see you next time. Hey Dave.
I was taking a look at your Hermie Hopper head here, mm -hmm. and I, I noticed, yeah. you know, something very unlike you. There's no manual in this game. It's not complete. What the hell's up with that? I know, Joe. It hurts my feelings badly. But, you know, long story short, I brought the manual to a sushi joint to get it translated, and the sushi chef that translated it just lost it conveniently. And, uh, you know, I was sad. I was totally out. It sucked. <laughs> you can't be serious. I am serious. <laughs> That's just pathetic. <laughs>
The graphics are really good for this game. It does suffer from slowdown and flickering in spots, but it's not enough to keep you from playing. Like I said, it's an easy game, and I only have trouble when I get to the Statue of Liberty boss. She doesn't even fight you. You have to defeat her by answering questions. Since the game is in moon language, I always lose. I have beaten the game, though, with the help of a fact. I thought the story of Dracula took place in the 1400s. The Statue of Liberty wasn't even alive back then yet. I think this game needs to check Wikipedia and get its facts straight. <laughs> Anyways, the music is good and quite whimsical, just like the game. I had a great time with this game, and you would have too if Konami decided to have released it worldwide. The Fireman is an overhead action game where you play the role of, um, a fireman. To my knowledge, this game was also released in PAL territories, but they don't count, so that's why it's in this episode. Ah, so this is the game you were talking about in the opening. Apparently PAL territories counted more than we do as far as this game is concerned. I know, dang it. Anyways, there is a large fire at a chemical factory in New York. It's your job to put it out and save innocent people that are trapped in the building. The game is played with two characters. You control one, and the AI controls your helper. Your character has a life bar, and also the level has a running timer countdown. Your helper walks around and puts out fires with an axe. You know, I didn't realize the fire snuffing abilities of an axe until I played this game. I love educational games like this. The fireman that you control wields the hose. There are three forms of attack. Your hose can shoot straight, or on the ground, and finally there's a water bomb. What? No water balloons? I know! Anyways, you can hold the L button in for a strafe attack, which is very useful on certain enemies. Your enemy in this game is, of course, fire. There are many different ways to put out fires. The straight hose shot is great for the majority of fires. The ground hose is great for fires on the ground that can't be put out with a regular hose. You might think that this is a boring idea, but it's actually pretty fun because the game will throw boss battles at you at the end of each level. Bosses can range from just errant fire to machinery that is on fire and has gone mad. Yeah, because that's what fire does. The machinery is super pissed off that it's on fire and killing humans just seems like the only logical course of action. Well, it's the only thing they can do. Well, anyways, graphically, the game is fair. Characters look okay and the fire looks great. The building and scenery are just average. The music and sound effects are fine. Music has a kind of jazzy upbeat tone to it and it fits the game pretty well. Anyway, you know, Dave, it's very rare that we see video games about fires. It kind of reminds me of Burning Rangers for the Saturn, but that was released everywhere. However, another fire game that was also left in Japan is for the Master System and it's called Megumi Rescue. The goal of this game is to rescue all of the Megumis from a burning building. This game requires a Sega paddle controller to play, but you can play it with a Sega sports pad set to sports mode and turned upside down. It's pretty twitchy, but you can play it this way. Anyway, you bounce off a trampoline in order to reach a Megumi and rescue it. Um, I don't think they're called Megumis, Joe. They're just people. Then why did they call it Megumi Rescue, huh? They wouldn't call it that if you weren't rescuing Megumis. Anyway, different Megumis will award you different amounts of points. For example, rescuing a cat is worth more points than rescuing a high school student. If the fire gets too high, people will jump or fall to their deaths unless you catch them. Once you rescue everyone, the fire truck comes and bombs the building. Yes, it bombs it. This game has a lot of fans, but I just can't get into it likely because I'm not using a real paddle controller and therefore I'm probably not giving it a fair shake. But that sound at the beginning of a stage, jeez that's loud. Didn't they listen to this game before they released it? Wow, you know, honestly, Dave, I had never heard of the Firemen before today, and it's always kind of cool to hearing about games you never even knew existed. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, like that Master System you just show, I never knew it existed until you completely took over my segment and put it out there. And you couldn't even use the correct controller, by the way, to feature it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Says the guy who can't even interpret the title of the episode. You're talking about a game that was released in jolly old England. <sighs> Joe. Uh, anyways, whatever. Let's just move on in. What games are you going to talk about? I'll show you. Let's check them out.
Sengoku Blade is a very Japanese flavored shooter. Hmm, yummy, my favorite flavor, Japanese. The title screen says Sengoku Ace Episode 2, however the box says Sengoku Blade, uh, so who knows what this game is really called. Anyway, you choose from a bunch of different flying characters. Each character has his or her own brand of firepower, assists, and bombs. You can power your character up and this affects your assists as well. These are activated by holding down the fire button. They're pretty weak at first, but some of them can be extremely useful. The bombs don't power up and are generally only useful for clearing the screen of enemy bullets. The first few stages seem to be selected at random from what I can tell. The graphics are very nice for the most part and is filled with tons of Japanese things and strange what have yous. The scrolling is generally pretty cool as well. Very pretty graphics in certain parts of this game, Joe. Like the dense forest in the beginning with lots of scrolling. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. The music kind of sucks though. I mean, it's appropriate for the setting, but it's mainly just unstructured Japanese instrument sounds thrown together. It's certainly nothing anyone would want to listen to outside of the game. The game is pretty challenging and it'll take you some substantial practice in order to beat it. My guess why it never came out to the US is because it was simply too Japanese and that scared pretty much any marketing department in the US. A funny story about my copy of this game. I originally bought it from Tronix and I remember owning it and enjoying it. But then one day I thought about this game and I looked on my shelf and it was gone. I hadn't seen it for quite some time. I assumed Dave stole it. Oh, naturally. You see, there's a large breasted chick on the front cover and that's the sort of thing Dave would steal. Hmm, I still might steal it. Anyway, he kept denying it over and over and over again. A few years later, a friend of mine cleaned out his closet. He called me up to inform me that he had found several US and Japanese Saturn games and that they were probably mine. Yep, Sengoku Blade was among them. Apparently, I had lent the game to him nearly 13 years ago and I just got the games back about two years ago. Sengoku Blade finally found its way back home in good condition. And I'm still waiting for my apology. Devil Hunter Yoko was released in 1991 by Messiah for the Mega Drive. You're a chick who runs around with a sword slashing various demonic things as well as possessed plant life. I've got some possessed weeds in my yard that won't die. Maybe I can hire Yoko to help. Uh, what the story is, I don't know, but I do know that it is based on some anime. Apparently Japan just can't have enough anime and manga series. There are probably hundreds and thousands of different anime series and I find none of them particularly interesting, but I do like playing games based on them if they're good. I originally rented this game and I found it incredibly difficult. I wanted to crush the game but somehow I restrained myself. I returned the rental in perfect condition. The manager of this store would end up being my friend who kept my Sengoku blade in his closet for 10 years by the way. It was Bill! I knew it! Yep. Anyway, the reason I found this game hard was that I just wasn't playing it right. I discovered that if you hold the button down you create a shield around yourself and that can be used to protect you and can also be tossed about as a weapon as well. This makes the game quite a bit easier and definitely more fun. But don't think for a second that this game is a piece of cake because it sure isn't. It's very challenging in fact. Most people don't even get past area 4. That's the stage with tons of annoying bats. Also, if you're a big fan of slowdown on the Genesis, then stage 4 is the stage for you. This game has to be hard since there are only five stages. The fifth stage is pure evil. This game has some good graphics as well as some average graphics in spots. Obviously two different artists worked on this game. Well, it's pretty much what you'd expect from a game with four mega power. Nothing in here will blow you away, but you shouldn't be too disappointed either. The music is pretty good. The first stage is a Japanese flavored theme, but it actually has some additional character to it and the music from other stages is even better. I'm not sure why this game was never released outside of Japan, but it may have been due to the licensed character. If anime and manga were as popular in the early 1990s as they are today, I bet this game would have had a chance here. Very true, but they still could have replaced her with Alex Kidd or something like that and they'd have a fine game that players abroad would have enjoyed. <laughs>
So, Joe, I was noticing that um, all the games you chose today, which are fine games, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, they all had female lead characters. Is there uh, something you want to tell us here? Yeah. <laughs> well, Dave, you know, I, I noticed that every game that you chose only let you play with male characters. Is there something perhaps you're trying to tell us? Um... All right, folks. Well, that's our show, and I suggest you go out and buy these games right away before the prices get hiked up yeah. way high on eBay. And we will see you next time. Dave, Dave, check yeah. this out, man. I got this game the from eBay. Uh, he said it was never released outside of Japan. It's, it only cost me one hundred and eighty dollars. I, you know, I'm not too into Super <laughs> Nintendo, but what? Did, did I get a good deal? Let me take a look at this thing. Joe, this is Super Mario All Stars. It was yeah. released in the United States, you idiot. What? What is that language? Is that Moon language there? No. Can you read that? Yeah. Oh my God. There's like a million of these floating around. Are you serious? Oh my God. Oh my God. You're so stupid. I'll just take that <laughs> and add it to my collection. Hello and welcome to GameSec. That's right, we're back again talking about more games that never saw release outside of Japan. Yeah, and this time we've taken a look at Google, about 30 seconds or so, to make sure that every game we talk about has never left Japan. Well, actually, Dave... Well, well what? Don't tell me. Well... Why? Well, did we screw the pooch? I mean... If we did, I'm going to unsubscribe oh, to come on, come on. Let, let's take a look at some of the games we have in store for this episode before you go ahead and do that. Ah, oh, we suck. Blastwind was originally an arcade game by Technosoft, but it came home to the Saturn. <laughs> Blastwind? That's also something I occasionally do after a spicy hot burrito. Here it comes! Yeah, anyway, as you can see, it's a vertically scrolling shoot-em-up. You have two different types of weapons that you can use at any time. A regular shot and a homing shot, both of which can be powered up. Of course, you also have a bomb available. The game keeps you on your toes with new enemies and the ability to choose your path from time to time by pushing little switches in the level. The different paths can even lead to different bosses. Obviously, this adds a bit to the replayability, and anything is better than nothing. You might want to pump up the difficulty on this one or resist the urge to continue because this game is a pushover for the most part. You can try challenging yourself to using only one continue, I suppose. Or you could try playing as a second player's ship, which is red. The game is a lot more challenging using this guy's ship because the firepower is so much weaker. But that's not really a viable option as you need to play with Player 2's controller and you can't start the game from that port. That's the thing with Technosoft games, they're usually very easy. But I still enjoy playing through this game like I do all Technosoft shooters. The graphics are fairly good, though nothing mind-blowing. Hey Joe, what is up with the high score and the 1P score on the sides of the playfield? I mean, that's pretty distracting. Yeah, they're giant, but I guess they needed something to fill the sides of the screen. Generally, the graphics don't really show what the Saturn can do, but they get the job done. The music is pretty damn good, but it's way too quiet. As a result, some of the explosion sound effects are too loud and very annoying. The music is great. It's certainly not Technosoft's best game, but it's a decent one. It didn't come out over here because none of Technosoft's Saturn games did. But it's worth hunting down if you are an obsessive vertical shooter fan. Well, I think Technosoft is still sore about Japan losing World War II, so that is how they punished the US. And trust me, it hurts. This is Ghost Sweeper Mikami for the Super Famicom. This is about Mikami, who I guess is a ghost sweeper. You think? I do. She must eradicate the city of ghosts along with her friends. 
That's just a guess, so I'm most likely wrong. As always. Anyways, this is an action platformer starring a cute little girl, Mikami. She might be a witch because she rides a broom in one level. You think? Stop that. Anyways, it's fairly straightforward as you move along using your wand to dispatch all sorts of ghosts and things that are possessed. Along the way, you will grab power-ups that will give your wand different types of projectiles. These work great, but if you get hit just one time, they go away. The control over Mikami is really good. I had no problems controlling her. The graphics are good. I found the game to be colorful and very pleasing to the eye. Yeah, me too. I like this style of graphics. It's not mind-blowing, but it's certainly good enough for me. Some of the bosses are pretty cool. I wonder if this game takes its bosses from the enemies in the manga series. They do. You've got the Ghost of the Train, Moga the Doll. Hey, I thought you didn't know anything about manga. The music is good, and I think I'd listen to the soundtrack on its own. And it works really good for the game, too. Some of it's decent, but otherwise it sounds like an average Super Nintendo game to me. You're average, Joe. If you can get this game, I recommend it, as I've had quite a bit of fun with this one. Hyper Duel is another shooter by Technosoft for the Saturn, this time a horizontal one. Like Blast Wind, this game is based on an arcade game. In fact, you can choose to play the arcade version or the special Saturn version. The arcade mode is, of course, pretty much exactly like the arcade. You choose your ship and set out to save the entire universe. Basically, you play as a transforming mech who can change shapes and firing formations at any time. I don't like changing into the robot because I usually die right away when I do and I don't really see any advantage to that mode. If you press both the robot and ship buttons at the same time, you get a spastic barrage of firepower as long as your meter has some strength in it. It recharges automatically or you can pick up special power-ups to help it along. This game is really fun and more challenging than Blastwind. I like this game more than Blastwind. I like that you can transform into a mech and have more control over your weapon. It's also crazy rare and expensive because Technosoft didn't make too many copies, I guess. But as you can see, the graphics are really good and the music is awesome as well. I think the sound effects aren't as harsh also. The Saturn mode changes the graphics with a bit more detail in the background and has lots of different colors. It has more of a digitized look to it, whereas the arcade had a slightly more hand-drawn look to it. The music also got redone, and it's awesome. I like the fact that they took the time to include a special version of the game in here. It makes me feel like Technosoft cares about me as a person. I'm really sure they care about you, Joe. I also think that the Saturn mode is a bit easier than the arcade mode, not that either are overly difficult or anything. Overall, it's a great game and lots of fun to play. Not quite as good as the Thunder Force games, but you know, that's okay. So how did the arcade mode and the Saturn modes compare to each other? See for yourself. Donna Megami Tanju was released in 1991 for the Mega Drive by IGS. 
It's a side-scrolling action platformer that really reminds me of Golden Axe. You know the saying, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Well, this is a good imitation of Golden Axe. Well, kind of. It doesn't play exactly the same as Golden Axe does or anything, but this game could easily take place in the same world. You play as a chick with a sword and the story is... well... But some wizard type guy gets kidnapped at the beginning of the game and the next thing you know you're riding a giant beast on your way to get him back. It's a game where the girl rescues the guy. The control takes a bit of getting used to. You can't really control your jumping distance very well so the platforming segments are going to take a bit of practice. You can also press down twice to crawl and avoid some attacks. And like Golden Axe you get a few different creatures to ride to assist you on your journey. One even lets you play like it's a horizontal shooter. There's also a magic meter that you get to build up just like, well, you get the picture. The game is very tough, or at least that's how it seems at first. Once your life bar is drained, it's game over and you only have five continues. I do keep wanting to try again though, it keeps me wanting to come back, so it definitely gets props for that. The game can be pretty violent. I love this guy, you chop off some of his arms and blood spurts out. Later in the game he comes back to fight you again and blood is still spurting out of his old wounds. He even keeps fighting you after you chop off his head. This is the kind of stuff that I like. The developers have thought through the game enough to keep this kind of detail. It really keeps the game together. The so called gore is probably the reason it didn't see a US release. It could have probably done okay after the likes of Mortal Kombat came out and changed the blood scene forever, but by then this game might have been too dated in the graphics and variety departments. The graphics are okay at best. The music was done by Tease Music and is very fitting and sounds like a Golden Axe game might. Even the sound effects are similar to Golden Axe. Overall, I've got to say, I enjoyed this game. Here's Pulseman by Game Freaks for the Mega Drive. Yep, the people responsible for Pokemon. Released only in Japan on cartridge. It did see a US release on the Sega channel, but since nobody can own a hard copy of that version, it doesn't count. Anyways, Game Force Boulder got this game in and was selling it for around $30, so I bought it thinking, what do I have to lose? The game is a typical action platformer. Pulse Man has a regular pulse shot, and when he runs, he powers up a shot that can be released for a more powerful charge. He also has the Voltecker or something like that, which when charged up allows him to bounce off the walls and reach higher areas and kill enemies at the same time. The game is really colorful and looks pretty sharp and the graphics are pretty well drawn. The music is average and I thought I heard one good song in the first three levels. I think the music goes well with the game, but mostly it's not very interesting to listen to on its own. The levels in this game are really long, longer than your average action platformer. It's a difficult game. Your player can get hit three times before he dies, but he seems to get hit rather easily. I have made it to the boss of the first level, but no further. You know, I can appreciate the qualities of this game like the graphics which are very well done for the most part. But even though I'm a huge Sega fan, this game just seems a bit overrated to me. The controls could be much better I feel as I seem to get hit rather easily. The game also has quite a bit of slowdown with very few objects on the screen. I guess Game Freak just sucks at programming or something. I've never touched a Pokemon series and I don't ever plan to so I have to judge the company using only this game. Then there's Pulse Man himself. He looks like a Mega Man villain and the name Pulse Man even sounds like a Mega Man villain. Too bad he doesn't play as well as Mega Man. There is a lot of voice in this game though, but the quality leaves a lot to be desired. Due to the efforts of Pulse Man, the case was completely solved. Like I said, it definitely has its good qualities, but I'd rather play something like Decap Attack starring Chuck D. Head. This game is available on the Wii Virtual Console if you want to give it a shot. Renta Hero is a unique RPG for the Mega Drive. You play as some random dude who gets a hero costume and can now whore himself out as a hero for rent. Actually I have no idea what's going on because the entire thing is in Japanese and I can't figure much out. You fight battles in a side view either as a normal dude or in your hero costume. All I know is I would have loved to have this game in English as it has lots of Sega in jokes from what I hear. The graphics look decent from what I can see and the music is done by the same guy who did Sword of Vermilion. Oh, and Space Harrier and Afterburner and Outrun. 
I can't really tell you much else about this game. I wish I could play it in English and I can't really comprehend why Sega didn't translate it and release it here. Uh, this is just another case of the suits at Sega thinking that small-minded American kids wouldn't understand or appreciate Japanese humor in situations. There is a fan translation out there, but who knows how accurate it really is. Well, the one I found only translates the very first part of the game, actually. Then it reverts back to Japanese. It's better than nothing since it also translates your standard menu selections, though. There is someone currently working on a full patch, and I hope it comes out soon. This game was also remade for the Dreamcast, and of course, that one didn't come over here either. Okay, Joe, all those games we talked about were left in Japan, as far as I know. Yeah. So, uh, what game were you referring to in the opening sequence? Well, one of the games you chose for this episode, obviously, because, you know, I would, I would never... Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. You know, <laughs> it, it is an awesome game, yeah. and it, it was actually released outside of Japan, but it's just to a small territory. Yeah, so. I, I think we can get away with, you know, talking about a game that was released outside of Japan in very limited quantities. Yeah, I agree. Just just very limited though, you know. Yeah. So but the game should have been released here. It's oh, it's totally awesome. Yeah. It's called Mr. Gimmick and let's take a look at it. Here we have the famous Mr. Gimmick for the NES. This game was only released in Japan and Scandinavia. I've also read that it was released on the PS1, but I can't find any evidence of that on the internet. I don't understand why Scandinavia was able to get it, but not Europe or the US. It's called Mr. Gimmick in Scandinavia, but the original title is simply Gimmick. Wow, is this a hard game? It's the ultimate trial and error game. That's all you really do is go and die and figure out what you did wrong so you don't make the same mistake the next time around. It's hard, but it's very fun. The control is really good, and by that I mean the control over your character in the platforming aspect of this game. Your character has a star power of some sort which is used as a weapon. It can also be used to reach higher platforms if you have enough patience to land on top of it and jump off it fast enough. It takes quite a bit of skill to really be able to control the star power. Besides fun gameplay, the game has some really colorful graphics that are nice to look at, especially for an 8-bit game. Very true, but you could find plenty of NES games that looked about this good late in the system's life. Sunsoft was very good at NES graphics almost all of the time. Very detailed earth tones and whatnot. The music is also very enjoyable. I think Sunsoft had a great music programmer back in the 8-bit era, as I enjoyed a lot of the music that came on Sunsoft games. Sunsoft ruled at music. They kept doing great music even on the Genesis up until those Western Bat and Squirrel games came out. It should also be noted that the Japanese version of Gimmick used a special sound chip inside the cartridge which adds an extra channel or two. We're playing this on a regular NES which is not fully compatible with what the Famicom can do, so those channels are either reworked or missing here. It still sounds really good though. As far as I can tell, this game has infinite continues, which is necessary to get anywhere. A great game, and if it was possible to find this game, I would suggest buying it, but good luck with that as it's super duper rare. Yu Yu Hakusho is a fighting game for the Mega Drive based on some anime in Japan. This is a game made by Treasure, and the graphics seem very similar to Guardian Heroes on the Saturn. Also similar is the ability to switch planes of depth as you're fighting. This can be very helpful in avoiding certain attacks. The fighting takes place in single match bouts. The characters all look like they're from the Dragon Ball Z universe or something. The game's biggest flaw, in my personal opinion, is that it uses a block button. Block buttons seem very unnatural to me as opposed to holding back on the control pad to block. You have two attack buttons, two dash buttons, and button Y switches your depth. Overall, the fighting isn't too bad, I suppose. However, I have really no desire to master it, mainly because the characters are completely uninteresting to me. Well, that's pretty much it. How can you hold your attention to something when you have no interest in it? I'm sure it stayed in Japan due to its anime roots and licensing might have been difficult. The graphics are pretty good with a variety of nice backgrounds. The backgrounds are great. You know, it's stupid, I know, but awesome backgrounds really are a big part of a fighting game for me. I like all the animation and cool artwork and effects. That's not stupid at all, I completely agree. But then again, I can be a graphics whore at times. 
Anyway, the music is your average treasure stuff. Not bad at all, certainly, but not the best on the system. There are a lot of Japanese voices, though. Overall, a decent fighting game with some quirky characters. And here is Splatterhouse Wanpaku Graffiti for the Nintendo Famicom. Well, to be honest, this game isn't really super great. It's just an average platformer. The reason I like it is because I'm a fan of the Splatterhouse series, and being so, I must have all the entries that were released. Well, except for the Abomination that was released on the PS3 and Xbox 360. I didn't buy into that one as it didn't appeal to me at all. You sure? I've heard people say decent things about it. You may want to pick that up for a good price. Mmm, I'm doubtful. Anyways, this entry into the series was made for the younger kids and the gory effects found in the other games were toned down. Some of them are still there, but just not gruesome looking. Yeah, but don't worry kids, you still get to control an axe-wielding maniac. The level and background graphics are rather uninspired. They're all flat and have no real depth to them. They do have a slight amount of animation here and there, which is nice. There is one layer of scrolling which looks kind of nice and helps, but not enough to be convincing. The music is pretty bad, completely unmemorable actually. It probably didn't come to the US because, well, actually I think you can plainly see why it didn't come to the US. Well, I'm, I'm probably sounding pretty harsh on this game. I mean, it's not as bad as maybe I'm making it sound, but well, you be the judge. I enjoy playing this game, but I feel that the majority of the people out there wouldn't care for it much at all. Dangerous Seed is a vertical shoot 'em up by Namcot for the Mega Drive. It's based on an arcade game by Namco. Basically, you start out with your standard shot and a bomb and shoot all sorts of enemies just like you'd expect. You can, of course, get different weapons and power them up accordingly and all that. The third button on the controller doesn't seem to do anything, at least not yet. You have a shield which can take a few hits before you die and then you get sent back. After you get past stage two, you get the ability to change formations which will make you fire your weapons in different ways. This is where the third button starts to work. Each formation has its own shield as well. After stage four, you'll get the third formation you can change into. You'll need all of them as this game can get pretty tough. There are 12 stages to battle through, but quite a few of the upper stages are really, really short. The graphics are fairly good and a decent translation of the arcade. The sound effects are okay at best, but the music is uncharacteristically good for a Namcot game. Ah, uh, I hate to say it, but I think the music is the best part about this game. I imagine it didn't come out in the US because there was a glut of shooters at the time, but it probably would have been safe to release this one. It's above average for the most part. It just seems like another bland shooter to me. Nothing seems eye-popping or super duper awesome. How does it compare to the arcade original? Check it out. D&D Collection Tower of Doom is a Saturn port of an arcade beat-em-up. Yeah, that was a great time to be a Capcom fan who owned a Saturn which could play import games. You got arcade translations which were almost exactly like the original. Yeah, the only difference is the Saturn port is a two-player game where the arcade was a four-player game. The game is fun and the control is good with only four buttons that come into play. There is a story here, but as you can see, it's all in Japanese. The game has branching paths that you can choose from. I have no idea, so I just choose one randomly and enjoy my choice. You can pick from four characters in this game and they level up as you go along. There are multiple types of attacks, but I like to just button mash my way through each area. Uh oh, you better be prepared to be lectured by somebody on how to play games. Oh, I'm scared. 
The enemies are all straight from D&D and are drawn really well. My only real complaint with this game is that the levels are really, really short and you'll spend about as much time watching the loading screen as you will playing this game. The music fits the game pretty well and the sounds are the usual Capcom arcade style. D&D Shadow of Mistara was also included in the same collection. The game from what I understand is a faithful port from the arcade and it takes advantage of the 4 meg RAM cart. Using that RAM cart always helped out the games tremendously and Capcom was the only company ever to use a 4 meg cart to its full capacity and their arcade ports were as close to perfect as you could get. Oh yeah! It's the same style of game but a different story from, well, I'm just guessing that anyways. The graphics have slight differences compared to the Tower of Doom. Also, this time around you can pick from up to 6 characters. It has the same button setup, but it's a bit easier this time around to select your secondary weapon. The stages are a bit longer in this game, so you won't be seeing the loading screen as much. The game does pause here and there during the gameplay to load. That's pretty wacky with a 4 meg RAM cart. I know, you're right. The action is pretty fast paced and hectic at times. I love how you can bend down and pick up coins and treasure during battle. You have a good eye for money since you're so super greedy. This also poses a problem. You see the button you use to collect items off the ground is the same as your attack button. So there are times when you're trying to attack an enemy but also trying to pick up treasure from the ground. Here's a tip. Defeat the enemy and then pick up the treasure. Money won't do you any good if you're dead, idiot. I'm picking it up for my kids. It's going in my will. Again, the game has pretty good graphics and decent arcade style music and sound effects. It's fun to play with a friend as it only supports two players as well. Princess Crown is a unique Saturn game from Atlas. Basically, the game begins with an attack on a castle by some sort of nasty monster. The queen defeats the monster and later you pop out, her youngest daughter. You sneak out of the castle because you want to star in your own action RPG, which is exactly what this game is. You wander from town to town, exchanging moon language with the locals, buying stuff, you know, stuff like that. Outside of the towns, you battle monsters and action segments. You carry a limited amount of items which can be cycled through, such as apples to restore some of your health. Soon you'll get a frying pan so you can combine and cook foods. The action is pretty straightforward, though the controls do seem to have a bit of lag. But the game is mostly playable, even if you don't know Japanese, you'll be able to figure most things out. The graphics are really well drawn and I like the character designs a lot. I like the idea that everything is on a horizontal plane. Towns, paths, in between towns, etc. It worked out really well for this game. I like the fact that your character and enemies are of a decent size and not just tiny little sprites that you can barely see. It really shows off the detail of the artwork. And let's not forget that this game led to a spiritual sequel called Odin's Sphere on the PS2, which is like a sequel to Princess Crown in many ways. Yeah, pretty much. The music is there, it's adequate I suppose, but it's nothing memorable at all. I am disappointed in Atlas for not bringing this out in English, but then again, hardly anyone brought anything out for the Saturn over here. I'm sure Tom Kalinske had something to do with this. That bastard. Alright, and that was a bunch more games for you that could have probably found some decent audiences had they been released over here in the Western Hemisphere. That's the Western Hemisphere, huh? That it is, yeah. Hmm. Well, what about uh, Australia? Hmm. Okay, Southern Hemisphere too, that's fine. Okay, well, what about Europe? I mean... What, okay, ah, okay, worldwide, alright. <laughs> there you go, Jeez. that's what we're aiming for. Alright, well thanks for watching Game Sack, and we'll squeeze out and pinch off another episode shortly. It is.
Okay, so you like my uh, Saturn import collection here? Yeah, this is great. I, you yeah. got some really good stuff here. I mean, yeah, of I, mean I love Silhouette Mirage. I love this game, Silhouette yeah, it's, Mirage. It's all right. I mean, it's complete. He's got the spine card. That's yeah, awesome. I always make sure they're complete. Yeah, spine card and everything is perfect. Yeah, I mean, I, look at this. Oh, I love this one. I've that got this generation one. Too. one? Yeah, yeah the one with the, the airplane. Yeah, yeah, 1942 you, series. Yeah, yeah, shoot down the enemies. That one's and complete stuff. too, but oh, yeah. oh. What? <laughs> Where's your spine card? I mean, what, did it fall out? Or that, that one didn't have a spine card. So what? What? And you bought it? Yeah. <laughs> oh my, yeah why? why? I mean, you're a collector, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta have everything. This is like a naked game. It's worthless. You might as well just throw it away or something. Oh my god! I, I, you can't be serious. Oh my god! I think I gotta go home. See ya. Anyway, we've got lots of other games to talk about in this episode that were left in Japan. And, well, I guess it should be fair that you kick it off. I Let's suppose. do that. Okay. I've got a great, well, it's a pretty good game. Let's yeah. take a look at it. Okay, cool. Mickey no Tokyo Daibuken is a Mickey Mouse game for the Super Famicom by Tomy. It's an interesting take on platforming. Mickey uses balloons as weapons and also to help him navigate the many challenges this game offers. There are two types of balloons, gas and water. Water balloons are used to kill enemies and also to trampoline to higher platforms. Gas balloons are used to float over gaps or enemies. The gas balloon is good, but it takes a bit of effort to control. And if you don't know how to use it, it'll send you flying across the screen, usually into an enemy or over a hole in the ground. These balloons are the only thing you have to get through this game, and you're going to need all of your skills because this game is tough. Fortunately, Mickey has an unlimited supply of gas and water to help keep filling these balloons. Where the hell is he getting it all from? Be sure to open treasure chests along the way to help you with extra lives and continues. Graphically, the game is pleasing with tons of colors and some decent scrolling effects. There are a few fun graphical references to Disneyland itself that add a really nice touch. The music is pretty good. The melodies are enjoyable, but sometimes they can grate on your ears with a blaring trumpet sound. I do enjoy this game as some of the levels are really well designed and will really challenge your ability to control your balloons. If you don't have enough Disney games in your collection, then I'd definitely recommend this game to you. I'm really surprised this didn't get a domestic release. Umahara Kawase is a fishing game for the Super Famicom. <laughs> well, it's not actually a fishing game, but your character's only weapon is a fishing line and a lure, so it's kind of like a fishing game. Basically, you have a very flexible fishing line and lure that can hook onto walls and help you navigate each level. Let me tell you, this is one strong fishing line. I'm guessing at least a 100 pound test. The line mechanic isn't as good as Super Castlevania IV's whip, but it's still very good. In fact, I'd say this has the second best swinging mechanic I've played. What's really strange is that there are 57 levels in this game and a 30 minute time limit. Certain areas have multiple doors that lead to different levels allowing you to experience more of the game than 30 minutes allows. It's quite an addictive game really. Control of your character is tough, but once you get the hang of it you'll feel very comfortable making the decisions about casting your line. The music is great, and I really think it fits this game well. Graphically everything is good except for the awful backgrounds which are just pictures that have been blown up and are really blocky and ugly. Ugh. The colors chosen for the backgrounds are also very dull. Maybe they did this on purpose to make the game's platforms and characters pop out. Another weird decision was to put all the game stats in the middle of the screen. I don't understand this as it can be very annoying and interfere with the gameplay. It's still quite a fun game and really well made. I highly recommend it. Gekibo, sometimes known as Photograph Boy for the PC Engine by Arem, is definitely a strange one. Now I'm not entirely sure what the story is, but I like to think that you just got hired at the local newspaper and your boss demands that you go around town and take pictures of noteworthy events as they happen. Your town is balls off the wall crazy and there's always lots of stuff going around to take pictures of. Basically you guide a cursor around the screen to snap photos of things that you deem worthy of being photographed. You don't have a lot of film, but you can magically earn more by taking pictures of certain things. Taking pictures also earns you points and you need to meet a point quota for each level. Also, watch out because you need to avoid hitting things like randomly bouncing balls or flower pots that are thrown at you. You can either jump out of the way to avoid them or take pictures of them to make them disappear. 
If you get hit, you lose some of your film because your character is extremely clumsy. The level ends either when you reach the end or you run out of film. If you don't meet the point quota, your boss is very angry and he won't let you go to the next stage, but you do have unlimited continues. The game's really funny with some of the things that happen in the background and there are a ton of movie and other pulp culture references. For example, you've got the car from Back to the Future, E.T., Spider-Man, The Terminator, Michael Jackson, and lots of other stuff. The game also seems very crude. For instance, there's a naked guy who flashes you in the first level and he's actually hidden in every other level. There's also nude chicks on the beach, a naughty Statue of Liberty, interesting graffiti, and lots of violent things you need to catch as they happen. But boy, this game's really tough until you completely memorize the stage and all of the things that you need to avoid kind of take some of the fun out of it. Still, it's an interesting game that no US publisher would ever touch. Do Re Mi Fantasy by Hudson on the Super Famicom is the supposed sequel to Mylon's Secret Castle. Now I've played a lot of Mylon's Secret Castle, I haven't even actually beat it, and the only few resemblances that game has with Do Re Mi Fantasy are the main character, Mylon, and his bubble blower. Other than that, it's pretty much a huge stretch. Now enough about that. Why this game was never released outside of Japan in its time is sinful as it's quite a fun game. Mylon must retrieve some musical instruments from some music hater. Each area boss holds an instrument, which you can get back after defeating them. The game is set in different worlds, with each world containing many levels which are usually pretty short. Mylan controls very well, and you won't have any problems with the platforming in this game. One cool feature that I liked was that Mylan wears three different colors of clothes. Each color represents his life bar, if you will. Green means you have three hits left, blue means two hits, and red means that once you get hit again, your life is over. Mylon's bubble wand is easy to use. If you shoot an enemy, they become encased in the bubble and you just have to touch the bubble to get rid of them. But be aware, the enemies do regenerate. Mylon can also stomp on an enemy's head, but this will only stun the enemy and actually turn them into a temporary platform, so it does have a lot more use. The music is nice and I found the melodies to be very enjoyable, but sadly a lot of the levels are pretty minimalist to the point where it's almost just ambient sounds. All in all, this is one game that should have made it off the island, as it's very enjoyable. This game was released for the Wii Virtual Console, so it can be had for $9, and it's easily worth that, even if it is a digital copy. As you might be aware, Nintendo really didn't support their mouse peripheral for the SNES or Super Famicom, and what games we did get were mostly bad with a few exceptions. But here's Mario & Wario, a game completely controlled by the mouse. An interesting tidbit is that this game was designed by Game Freaks, you know, the makers of Pokemon? Anyways, you can choose from Mario, Yoshi, or Peach, but you don't actually control any of them. As you can see, Wario drops something onto their heads, making them blind. Unlike a normal person who would just take the affliction off their head, they're either unable or unwilling to do that and just walk blindly in whatever direction they're facing. You use the mouse to control a small fairy who changes the environment so that these dunces don't hurt themselves. Ultimately, they'll run into Luigi, who, usually the witless one, will take the blinder off their head. The game controls really well, and the game boards can be very challenging, but not impossible. A lot of the times the boards are much bigger than one screen. Luckily, when you pause the game, you can scroll the camera all across the screen to help plan your path. The music isn't anything great, and honestly, after playing, I can't recall any of the tunes in my head. They're just unmemorable. The game boards and characters are all super colorful, and being on the Super Famicom, they should be. This is a great game for collectors of Nintendo released games. It's fun to play and is part of a relatively small library for the Nintendo Mouse, and it can be had at a reasonable price. Koryun on a PC Engine is another so-called cute-em-up. The story is, well, I'm not sure. Some giant thing appears and makes the princess into a child or something, so you, as her pet dragon, takes off to get bloody revenge. Right away, you'll be thrown into a chaotic world with tons of stuff on screen. You can collect fruits for extra points in order to earn more lives, as well as different weapons, each of which can be powered up three times. 
You can also grab a screen clearing bomb for those tough moments, some extra options that float around you and shoot, or even an extra item which makes you a lot smaller to help avoid getting hit by the enemy. If you've collected a weapon, you can take one hit, but if you get shot while using your default weapon, well, then you lose a life. If you let go of the fire button for a while, you can even build up some kind of super burn shot. The action is often so crazy, and with all of the fruit and the enemies on the screen and everything else, you just don't know what items you can collect and which will kill you. So good luck. There's lots of parallax scrolling, cartoony graphics, and great music. Everything's really fast and the background even changes sometimes during a stage and there's plenty of mid-bosses. If all this looks and sounds familiar, well, it should. This game is very similar to Airzonk. In fact, you can tell the same engine was used for the graphics, sounds, and play mechanics. But this game came out before Airzonk did, so I guess you could say Airzonk is more like Coriune. However, if you like Airzonk, you'll certainly like this. I only have two real complaints about the game. The first one is that it's pretty easy. There's a stork around to give you a power up every few seconds, so it's unlikely that you'll be using your default weapon very much. This means you'll be able to take lots and lots of hits as long as you keep grabbing a colored ball before you die. Plus, all of the fruit makes it really easy to earn extra lives. In fact, you might want to try playing it on the hard difficulty from the get-go. My second complaint is that you need to refight all of the bosses at the end before you get to the final boss. This is a huge pet peeve of mine in any game that does this. It just feels like a really cheap way to extend the game. Still, this is a great shooter and I'm surprised it never saw a US release. Unfortunately, now it usually sells for over $200 on eBay. Konami's YY World for the Famicom is a really fun game that sadly never made it out of the land of the rising sun. The concept is really intriguing. You start the game with Konami Man and Konami Girl. As you travel through the world, you have to rescue other Konami franchise characters that are being held captive in their respective game worlds. Once this is accomplished, that character becomes playable. So Goemon, for example, is held in Edo, Simon Belmont is held in Dracula's castle, and so on. The levels in this game aren't set up so that you can just pick one and make it through using Konami Man. You must use rescued players' abilities to help. For example, on the pirate ship rescuing Mikey from the Goonies, you need to use Simon Belmont and the reach of his whip to kill enemies on the platforms. If not, then you'll surely die as there's no room for you and the enemy on this small area. So the goal of each level is to find the key to unlock the device that each character is being held in. Some levels have boss fights to obtain the key, while others the key is just sitting there waiting to be collected. Characters control pretty well, but not as good as the games they come from. I noticed Simon's whip couldn't be used as fast as in a Castlevania game, but that's a minor complaint. I really like how being hit by enemies doesn't throw your character back or even stop their forward motion. In some instances, you can just plow through a level to get past a tough area if needed. Another really cool thing is that depending on the character you use, the music changes to that character's theme. You can change characters on the fly and the music changes just as quick. I really like this feature, even though I don't feel Simon Belmont's theme really fits while playing in the city level. Graphically, the game is good with loads of colors and some good details on enemies and characters. Overall, this is an outstanding game that you should try if you get the chance. If you can't read Japanese like me, there is a well-written fact that is priceless over on GameFAQs. Three years later, in 1991, Konami released YY World 2. This sequel changed up quite a few areas of the game. Firstly, the graphics have been changed, and a lot of the levels have forced scrolling. Characters are now super deformed and the enemies are much cuter than the first game. The game levels are pretty much chosen for you. There are a few branching paths where you can pick between two levels, but you'll ultimately end up in the same path. The music is still outstanding, but the music belongs to the stage now and not the character you're using. Speaking of characters, you can pick from a chosen set of three at the beginning of the game. Throughout each level, you can collect a power-up which lets you choose from one of the other characters to pick on the fly. This time around, the special character is on a timer and will revert back to Konami Man once time runs out. The baby from Bio Miracle Bokute Upa is by far the best character in the game as he has the smallest hit radius and his weapon, a baby rattle, is really quick. This game isn't as good as the first game in my opinion, but is still a quality game on its own.
All right, everybody, there is another handful of great games that never left mm -hmm. Japan. Yeah, we're running out of them, though. We so. are. I'm down <laughs> to the bare minimum on my uh, collection. Yeah, so. but but we are collectors. We still buy import games from Japan, so maybe we'll stumble across some more in the future. And if so, we'll make a Left in Japan 5. Yeah, let us know what games are great that we should pick up if they're not absolutely yeah, if insanely you're, priced. Yeah, <laughs> if you're from the future, you probably already know if there's a Left in Japan 5 or not. But we here right now, sitting here in this room, do not know yet. No clue. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching GameSack, and we'll catch you next time. Hey Dave, you're yeah. ready to shoot episode 71 of GameSack? Well, I'm almost ready. I don't think you're ready yet. What are you talking about? Well, be, you, I'm totally ready. I'm dude. sure you yeah. noticed that we're wearing this exact same shirt. and um, Dude, come on. I'm, I'm not changing my shirt. I, I did a little laundry this week. This is the only shirt I washed. I'm not changing my shirt. You have to. We're going to look like idiots. In... <laughs> we look like idiots anyway, and what do I well, care? Well, that's true, but I'm not driving a half hour to get to my house just to change a shirt dude, so we I'm, can have I a different shirt. It's not my problem that you live a half hour away. I, you're the one who decided to move to that location, not me. I'm not changing my shirt. I'm so a it's Nintendo kind of... fanboy. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting into it. I'm getting into it. I'm starting to like the games. Hello, and welcome to GameSack. And another Left in Japan episode. We're going to start with a sharp twin Famicom. Hello and welcome to GameSack. And once again, we're talking about games that were never brought out of Japan for everyone else to enjoy. Yeah, this is going to be our fifth episode of maybe 10 or 20 or something. Who knows? I don't know. There's a lot of games that never came out that we're probably not even aware of. I mean, oh, there's I a ton of them. Even yeah. for this episode, there's some games I wasn't even aware of. Really? Games that I was talking about, I imagine. Yeah. Not games that you were talking about because you know you were talking about them. Well, of course I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've got the first game, so let's take a look. Here's Frey in Magical Adventure, also known as Frey CD and sometimes even as Frey Zack Gaiden. We'll just call it Frey. Anyway, this is a CD game for the PC Engine Super CD-ROM in Japan. Frey is a blue-haired girl who runs around blasting enemies with her magic wands. It kind of plays like a poor man's Toilet princess if you remember that from our X68000 episode. This is a spin-off from the Zack series and it takes place during Zack 2. I don't have any of the Zack games, so unfortunately I can't show them to you at the moment. Anyway, the hero from Zack saved Frey from an animal, and she still dreams about him while attending magic school. Now, I'm not really sure about the rest of the story, but I imagine we're saving the universe as we know it. One thing's for sure, there are lots of monsters and the like that want you dead. You can fire at them or hold your shot for a powerful blast. If you have a magic icon, charging your shot will release it. Between the action stages are towns where you can get clues, buy items and weapons, as well as save your game. There are NPCs to talk to as well. Some of them will even help you out like the Japanese Moses here who will part the sea so you can continue on your journey. Thanks Japanese Moses! The gameplay is mostly pretty easy to figure out, but I really wish I could shoot diagonally. Well, I guess you kinda can if you have the right weapon. This game can get really frustrating. Precision jumping is absolutely required in some areas. The controls just don't feel like they're up to the task. The graphics are nice and bright, but there really isn't much in the way of animation here. The music is bouncy and cute, but to be honest, it starts to get a little annoying after a while. And there is a ton of voice in the game. It pauses to load voices quite often and everyone wants to talk. For example, this boss has something to say between nearly every single attack she throws at you. It really does kind of kill the pacing of the game. Oh well, at least when you defeat her, you get to blast her top off. Still though, it's a fun game and you'd probably have a good time with it. This is Gunbari Daiku no Gensan for the Super Famicom, but we know him in the West as Hammer and Harry. This particular version for the Super Famicom never made its way to the Super Nintendo. Hammer and Harry is a fitting name as a hammer is Harry's weapon of choice. This is a side-scrolling action game by IRAM and is one of the many Hammer and Harry games released in the arcade, various Nintendo systems, and the PSP. I actually really like this game and had a lot of fun playing it, but I gotta say it's a bit on the easy side. 
Your hammer can be upgraded, you can get shirts that will let you take more damage, and you can collect a screen clearing special. It'll release stars from your hammer if you activate it from the ground, or it'll just clear the screen if you activate it from the air. You play as Harry and, you know what, that's all I know about the story since I can't read Japanese. It's not a problem though, as there's no real language barrier here at all. Sure, you'll miss out on what might be a really great story, but who cares, right? The action is solid and the control is really good. Just like in real life, beating people up with a hammer feels very satisfying. Graphically, the game is great with nice backgrounds and lots of color. The characters take a bit to get used to as they are short and huge all at the same time. There's not a lot of variety in the enemies and I'm okay with that as they're not super ugly or anything. The music is okay. For some reason, I really like the music in stage 3. The melody is really kooky and I like it. It's kooky. I think this title would have been a great game for an English translation and brought to America, but it wasn't meant to be. Try it out if you can, you might like it. You know what time it is. Remember when we talked about Tempo back in the 32X episode? It was a game where you start as a bug doing musical things on some kind of TV show. Or something like that, I don't know. Anyway, he had a sequel called Super Tempo and it was only on the Saturn in Japan. I'll just start off by saying that I like this game a lot more than I like the original. I could just never really get into that one. This time you launch bubbles at your enemies. You collect musical notes and these are used as currency to buy stuff for your house. This time you play as both Tempo and his main Squeeze. Certain levels will let you switch between the two while other levels are dedicated to one or the other. Some of the levels even have objectives, like this one where I can't pass through this door until I find the ghosts of all four animals. Tempo's girl can fly and reach high places so you'll definitely need her to find and revive some of the dead animals. There's even a shooter level which pays some tribute to old classics like Missile Command or even Asteroids. That's pretty cool. Or how about this? Yeah, he's pissing out an entire waterfall there. Why? Because Japan, that's why. The boss fights are always inventive and fun. Basically, you've got to wait until you get the special icon before you truly have the ability to win. On the first boss, Tempo becomes a massive steroid monster and you need to keep pounding down on the button to give him more steroids so he grows faster than the boss and pops him. Or this one where Tempo's girl gets boxing gloves and she has to punch her way to victory. You gotta have some quick reflexes in this one. There are also mini games which can be played for a price, kinda like arcade games. My favorite is this one where you need to eat the pizza while your bug wife isn't looking. She doesn't want you eating pizza or doing anything even remotely enjoyable and she'll let you know it. I really like the graphics, they're drawn really well and they're nice and clean and overall a joy to look at. The music fits the game though, it's nothing tremendously special. So why didn't this game come to the US? Well, maybe it had something to do with the pissing bugs. Or that it was 2D, you know, I don't know. But the Saturn definitely could have benefited from having this out everywhere else besides Japan. Genji Tsushin Agedama was released on the PC Engine at the end of 1991. It's based off of the anime of the same name, but don't ask me anything about that as I've never heard of the anime until I started playing this game. This is an action platformer with a forced scrolling screen. In all honesty, sometimes when playing this game I really feel like I'm playing a shmup as it plays fairly similar. Your character controls really well, which is great, as there are some areas in this game with lots of platforming. An auto-scrolling game with lots of small platforms and enemies to shoot makes it easy to miss said platforms. Don't worry though, because if you miss a platform you won't die, but you will lose one part of your life bar. The auto scrolling stops at the second half of level 5. I don't know why it does this, but I thought it was kind of interesting. You have a small pea shooter for your basic weapon. Along the way you will pick up icons which give you more powerful attacks. There are 5 different types of attack power. These are done by holding the 2 button in which fills a meter at the top of the screen. You can stop the meter at any time and this will fire off whatever attack power was highlighted on the meter. The system works pretty well and all of the attacks are helpful. I only had one problem with the control. Instead of ducking when you push down, your character does a somersault forward. It works fine in evading enemy attacks, but it also helps you fall off ledges and platforms very easily. The graphics are good with lots of color and some areas with nice scrolling effects. The music is great and it works really well with the action. This is definitely an import worthy game and it's not priced too badly, so it might be worth a look if you're interested. Z 
Zero Gunner 2 is an overhead shoot 'em up for the Dreamcast. This one's a little different from most shooters since you can rotate your ship in any direction instead of only being able to fire forward. You'll need to do this a lot as enemies will constantly come from the area you're not shooting and the screen scrolls in pretty much every direction. It can take a little time to get used to the controls and sometimes you might find yourself stuck in a certain direction, unable to turn around the way you want to in time. Ouch. You can choose from three different helicopters in the beginning. They each control the same, but they just have different weapons and special attacks. For example, the Hokum here has a very wide purple shot, the Apache has a narrow, concentrated stream of bullets, and the Comanche has a powerful solid beam that blasts intermittently. The stages are always presented in a random order, which I kind of find interesting. I guess they were just trying to keep things fresh with each playthrough. Each stage has about three different bosses that you need to battle your way through. And of course, sometimes a boss will eject part of itself and then you'll have to go and defeat that. You also pick up tons of little blue energy chips or whatever they are. They charge a meter on the left which regulates your special attack. Every enemy in the game leaves these energy chips behind when they die. As far as power-ups go, red enemies leave icons which will power up your main gun a few levels. The graphics are really sharp, smooth, and detailed. It all just looks really nice. Some of the music is kind of mediocre, but some of it's really good too. Too bad it's relatively quiet and there's no way to turn it up. This is a fun shooter that doesn't take its gameplay too far into the gimmicky realm like some other games and it's easily accessible to non-Japanese speakers. Check it out if you like shooters. You know, Joe, I love doing these Left in Japan episodes, but there's one thing that just drives me freaking insane. What's that? Well, it's pronouncing some of the names of these games. I mean, they're... Oh, yeah. The, the two you had were pretty... pretty yeah, good. and I, I know I hacked them up pretty good, but, you know, the games are fun, and my Japanese is horrible. Yes, so. it is. Anyway, you've got... The next one you've got is, well, it's not really a tongue twister. It's... It, no. I don't think it was called this in the U.S. It was called Robotech. I yeah, Robotech, so. uh, Macross in Japan, I guess. Yeah, and so maybe Europe, I don't know. Show us a Macross game then. The Super Dimension Fortress Macross was released on the Sega Saturn in 1997. It's a shooter that follows the anime entry titled Do You Remember Love? I don't. Before every level, you're treated to snippets from the anime to help progress the story. There is so much animation here that the game was released on a two disc set. Stages 1 through 5 are on the first disc and 6 through 10 are on the second disc. You must have a game saved after stage 5 in order to access disc 2. Yes, the game does save, which is the first hint that this isn't a hard game. And you also have infinite continues. It's fine though, as the game is enjoyable for the cutscenes alone. Graphically, the game is just okay. Everything is discernible, but it's all pre rendered and looks really jaggy. I wonder what this game would have looked like if it was all hand drawn. Wow. Gameplay wise, it's pretty much a pushover. Enemies are thrown at you on three different planes. The first and third plane can only be hit with your missiles, and the second plane with missiles, machine gun, and a bomb. It's really weird because with this setup, your missiles become your weapon of choice. They lock onto enemies automatically, and all you have to do is hold in the B button to lock on and then release. Keep repeating this over and over, and that's enough to walk through pretty much the entire game. It's kind of cool for a while, watching your missiles fly and seeing their trails, but it becomes less cool later on because you're constantly using them. You can transform your ship into all three modes, but I find the jet fighter to be the best and pretty much remain that way. The music is straight from the enemy, and it works really well. It definitely added to my enjoyment of the game. All in all, the game is pretty average, and it will be a cakewalk for most shooter fans. But if you do like Macross, you most likely will enjoy this game. And if you don't like it, then this is not for you. You decide. Dry Rush Depi is a really hard game to find for the Saturn by Nihon Create. Basically, the world is inhabited with living cars. You're a taxi cab, and from what I gather from the intro, you're about to race, but you quickly get trampled. Then suddenly, you're in a side-scrolling platformer just trying to make your way to the goal. Your gas is constantly running out, so be sure to grab cans of gas whenever you see one. Like any car, you can jump and you also have a dash attack. The dash attack uses up a little extra gas. This attack can also be charged for a far more powerful attack which uses up a lot more gas. You're shown the weak point of the bosses before you fight them and hitting that point can be tougher than you might think. You also collect little pink neon stars and truthfully I'm not sure what they do, probably just points and eventually an extra life. 
But speaking of those, there are star rooms hidden around some of the levels which let you collect even more little pink stars. The graphics are really good. I like the art style and the colors are fantastic. The scrolling is also really nice. Even the music is pretty good. So why didn't Tri-Rush make his way out of Japan? Well, to be honest, this game really isn't that great. The controls are very slippery and Tri-Rush moves for quite a while after you let go of the controller. Timing and aiming your jumps is also a bigger chore than it looks. When you take a hit or attack a point of a boss that's not the weak spot, your recovery time is annoyingly long. Also, sometimes the police will pull you over for no reason whatsoever other than just to waste your time. Earlier I said that this game is hard to find. Maybe that's because no one's really looking for it. Lupin the Third for the Super Famicom is a fairly fun game. I've actually watched quite a few Lupin TV shows and movies, so I'm familiar with the characters unlike some of the other anime-based games I've mentioned in the past. As you would expect, you control Lupin throughout the entire game. The other characters only make appearances during cutscenes. And of course, everything is in Japanese, so I don't know what's going on or how the story is unfolding. I wish I could understand it, as I'd probably enjoy it. Anyways, the game plays as an action platformer. The majority of the levels are mazes, and basically you're just trying to find the end. As you make your way through each level, you have items that you can use to help you reach your goal. Lots of really cool things for you to use, like a grapple rope, dynamite, a gun, and shoes that let you jump higher. Most items are limited, so you'll need to pick up icons along the way to replenish them. You use the shoulder buttons to scroll through the items to select the one that you want to use. It works fairly well, but can get kind of annoying in certain situations. For example, you're low on health and you need to replenish your life, but you're busy finding an enemy with your gun. You can't use both, so you must pick what to do first. Heal or kill your enemy. It could be fatal if you make the wrong choice. You could die! Lupin controls fairly well. I did have a few problems with the jumping mechanic. I never died from it, but did lose a bit of health sometimes. Graphically, the game's not too bad. There isn't a lot of variety in backgrounds, which kind of sucks, but on the other hand, the music is very enjoyable and sounds really good. I had a great time playing this game, and I'd recommend it to anyone looking for a different experience on the Super Famicom. Kaze no Densetsu Xanadu 2 or Legend of Xanadu 2 is an action RPG for the PC Engine Super CD by Falcom. You play as a character named Arios and your companion is Daimos. I'm just guessing on those pronunciations by the way. Anyway, you're searching for some friends whose ship was attacked by dragon riders. Ooh. Just as you'd expect, there's lots of wandering around towns, talking to NPCs and getting items that you need to get further in the game. The battles are very similar in style to the early games in the East series as you just bump into the enemies to attack them. You actually do get to see the attacks happen though, unlike in East. Now this bothers some people a whole lot, let me tell you, but you know, it really doesn't bother me at all. It's fun. Enemies leave behind little jewels which are used for currency as well as other random items like health. When you fight a boss, the action switches to a side view style where you have to swing the sword yourself. You can also shoot upwards and jump to dodge attacks. But that's not all, you can also charge your attack by holding down the button and you'll find yourself relying on this quite a bit. The control here is a bit loose and fast and it kind of reminds me of East 3 but it's good enough to get the job done. Of course figuring things out when everything is in Japanese is a bit tough and you'll have to do a lot of guesswork about what needs to happen in order to trigger the next event. I've heard an English translation is in the works and I'm definitely looking forward to that. I wonder if they'll translate all of the game's cutscenes. I don't know, that would seem like a rather daunting task. The graphics are really nice and they stand up there with the best 16-bit RPGs. They really shine when you fight the bosses. The music is pretty good, though it's all generated by the system and very little of it actually comes off of the CD. I really like this game, it's super fun to play and we could have definitely used more games like this outside of Japan. Especially on the Turbo. Here's Magical Poppin' for the Super Famicom. And of course it's another game that never made it outside of Japan or obviously I wouldn't be talking about it now. That's a shame too, as it's a terrific game. It's a side-scrolling platformer with lots of charm. You play as a girl on a quest to retrieve some stolen gem or something. Not really an interesting story, but who cares, the gameplay is what you're really here for. As you make your way through each level, you can collect hearts which will increase your life bar by one. 
You can also collect princess icons, which will give you an extra life once you collect three of them. Also, each level has a special item you collect, which can be anything from a sub weapon to an ability that helps you clear a level. Like this swinging rope thing that lets you grapple onto certain objects to get to higher areas or clear large gaps. I had lots of trouble with this mechanic, and I'm fairly convinced it's actually me with the problem and not the game. Everything else actually controls very well and is very responsive. There's lots of platforming in here, but it's nothing real difficult and it's just simply a fun game to play. All the levels are very colorful with nice detail and lots of different locales. Fighting enemies is a breeze, and each area has a mid-boss as well as a final boss, neither of which, of course, are really very hard. The music is really enjoyable, but a bit on the quiet side. I really liked a lot of the melodies in here, so they should have made it at a higher level. A lot of people will want to play this game, but once they see how much a damn copy goes for, oh man, it makes it quite a bit less desirable. Alright, and there's 10 more games that never came out of Japan for whatever reason, unless you imported them mm -hmm. or bought a repro card or emulated them or whatever. Yeah, we were very deprived as a gaming society, Joe, here in the United States, and it sucked. But, you know, at least we found out about them now, and we're able to bring them to you. Hopefully you haven't played all of these games and learned something new. Oh, you know they all have, and they'll, tell, they'll let us know. They'll let us know. So, <laughs> anyway, what are some other games that you'd like to see on Left in Japan 6 when we get around to mm -hmm. making that? Um, we love to hear your ideas because we often find games that we've never yeah. even heard of. Yeah, definitely. So, in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. Check this out, Joe. This, look up? at this import game I just won on eBay. What is it? It's the Davis Cup Tennis for my PC Engine. Oh, is it any good? Oh, are you serious, dude? It's tennis. It's awesome. How's the music? The music, it makes you just want to play tennis. I love it. Oh, very tennis-y, huh? So, I was thinking about covering this in our next episode. I don't think people really want to see that. They didn't care what about when we covered sports. Why don't you like cover one of, my, one of my games? How about this one? People want to see this. What's this? Forever with me? What is this? Some sort of love game? English titles on the side. Other side, did you? Chico Asabar Paradise? Paradise? <laughs> Can't you pronounce anything? I read it verbatim, dude. What are you talking about? Will you pronounce it? Fine. GQ Asiaberry Paradius. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Hello and welcome to GameSack. That's right, it's Left in Japan 6. And we've got 10 more games to talk about that never left Japan, especially mm -hmm. back in their day. Not just 10 games, these are 10 awesome games that you're going to be pissed that never made it out of that country. <laughs> That's right, I'm actually pissed, but I am too. thankfully we can import them, and some yeah. of them, I hope you imported them a long time ago because they're kind of expensive yes. now. So anyway, let's just get right on into it. Urusa Yasura, my dear friends, by Game Arts on the Mega CD is based on the manga and anime in Japan. Or is it dear my friends as the game case says? I don't know. Anyway, this one is a point and click adventure where you can interact with lots of stuff. Of course, everything is in Japanese, so I don't have a firm grasp of what's going on. But basically, you play as a Taru, who's a high school hornball running around trying to pick up every single girl he sees. But the problem is Lum. She's an alien, and she thinks she's your wife since you accidentally proposed to her. The original voice actors of the anime are here to voice their characters, and the whole thing is quite the production. The animation is full screen, and it looks awesome. Now this isn't grainy FMV, but rather proper looking in-game animation. In fact, I've got to say it's definitely some of the best traditionally done animation I've seen done for any system in the 16-bit era. Anyway, back to the gameplay. You can look around at things, talk to people, and even interact with certain items in any given scene. Looking at or touching certain things can make odd things happen for absolutely no reason whatsoever. 
It just shows how whimsical the game is, and I love that kind of stuff. You can also pick up items and carry them in your inventory. You'll definitely need to get familiar with this as you'll need to use an item or something on somebody to proceed and all that good stuff. Sometimes it's funny, like giving flowers to this dude which seems to embarrass him. I mean, come on, can a dude give another dude some flowers at the local high school? You go from location to location via a giant map that links everything together. I love games like this. For some reason, they just really intrigue me. You can use the Japanese mouse and that helps tremendously when navigating throughout the game. I don't know if the US mouse will work as I don't have one to try, but it's still quite playable even with a regular controller. You can even find a CD which acts as a sound test for the game. Speaking of which, the music, while simple, is pretty good and definitely fitting. The graphics are all really bright and colorful and I've already mentioned the superb animation. You can also find game cartridges to play on your in-game video game system. These are pretty cool. One is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that even two players can play. It's kind of floaty, but it's still kind of fun. Another is a defender-like shooter with giant ships that drop smaller ones and you need to destroy them all. In the third game, you play as a fat white cat who's trying to catch all of the food as fast as he can as it's dropped from the sky. But be careful, don't catch any of the non-food items or you'll sleep for a long time. I love that they thought to include stuff like this. You win. Now this isn't the longest game in the world, but you'll be going back and forth trying to see which item works on what just to get further. So it actually might take you quite a while, especially if you don't understand the language. Everything is voiced in Japanese and there are no subtitles or in-game text at all. That means they'd have to translate and re-record all of the voices and it's likely they didn't want to spend the money or the time to do that. It really is no wonder why it wasn't released anywhere else. But the anime scene was starting to bloom in the US when this game came out, so who knows, it could have been a sleeper hit. So you all know that as far as shooters go, I tend to like the cute ones like Parodius or Air Zonk. Well, Harmful Park for the PlayStation is another cute em up and it's easily one of the best in the genre. I don't know what the story is exactly, but I can guess that it revolves around an evil scientist who's taken over an amusement park and made it evil. What better setting could you have for a cute em up? From the first few moments of playing, I knew I was experiencing something very special. I was glued to the screen just soaking in all of the awesome detail the game offers. Every level is loaded with animation and funny artwork and just insane ideas. Your character controls well and you have four different weapons that you can switch to at any time. They're all variations of weapons that are standard in most shooters. You've got a basic potato shot, laser ice cream, and a homing jelly shot. There's even a pie shot that isn't quick but is powerful. Each of these weapons can be leveled up four times and they all have their own special shot. Every level is designed really well and is loaded with enemies and gems that you can chain for lots of points if you're into that kind of thing. For me, I just enjoy playing the game and soaking in the atmosphere. Like here, where a couple is getting married and some guy runs in and takes the bride. Then right after that, a huge monster of Frankenstein shoots lasers at you with his middle fingers. I was laughing my ass off at all of this. The music is really wacky and is perfect for the game, but there's only one or two tracks I'd listen to outside of playing. It's a shame that Skythink Systems isn't around anymore as they definitely had talent. If you want to play this game, which I think you should, then the best way to do so is to download it from the Japanese PSN store like I did. I'd really like to have a physical copy of this game, but sadly I can't find one for less than $250 and I'm not going to pay that much, but playing it here on my PS3 is the next best thing. <laughs> Lunar Magic School on the Saturn is a side story to the Lunar RPG franchise, or Lunar as some people say. This is a port of the original game on the Game Gear which was also only released in Japan. And if I have a choice between playing a Saturn or a Game Gear version of a game, I'm going to choose the Saturn version every single time. You begin the game with Ellie, Lena, and soon Senya who've been recruited to attend Magic School. Each student has their own magic abilities and now it's time to do some learning. But there's evil brewing about, and of course, you're just gonna have to take care of that sooner or later. Anyway, first off, I must say that this game feels very smooth. The characters move quickly and smoothly, and it doesn't feel like the game is wasting my time. And check this out, the characters can even move diagonally. I never understood why all RPGs just don't do this. The battle system is pretty good. You have your attacks and your magics. But each time you defend, you'll gain some magic points back, and you'll have to do this more often than you might think. It's not a big deal or anything, it's just kind of interesting. In later chapters, characters can combine their magic together for more powerful attacks. The battles are quick and usually take less than a minute. 
The graphics are nice and pleasant with good sprite work and transparency. The battles also look nice, but I just wish there were more variety in the backgrounds. The music is good, but I also wish there was more of it as well. Sometimes you'll get an FMV anime cutscene to advance the story and they look okay. There are no items to buy in the game, no inns to stay at, and in fact there's no money system at all. And honestly, this is all kind of refreshing. Your magic levels up with you and this game is pretty much all about the magic. One really nice feature that I wish every RPG had is the ability to save anywhere and anytime you want except during a battle. But if there's one thing that brings this game down, it's the random battle encounter rate. You usually don't have to move very far at all and then, God, another battle? Fortunately, the battles are quick like I said, but it still gets really annoying. So why didn't this come out elsewhere? Well, because this is a Saturn, that's why. But with a good translation and some rebalancing of the battles in the encounter rate, this could have been a really nice RPG in English. The Adventures of Little Ralph is an action platformer for the PlayStation. This is another game where I have no idea what the story is but it's completely playable without knowing any Japanese. In fact, there are only two buttons that are used. There's the jump button and the action button which swings your sword. There's lots of platforming going on here and Ralph feels up to it as he controls fairly well. I did have some problems with judging platforms but once I got the feel for how Ralph controls I did just fine. That's a good thing as the game is loaded with platforming and some of it's pretty tricky, but they all have patterns and once you figure them out it's pretty easy. The one part that I had tons of trouble with is this stupid minecart. Holy crap I died a lot here. Thankfully the game has infinite continues so I could keep trying and of course keep dying. Speaking of dying, Ralph can take two hits before he's done. I think a life bar would have been better here but it is what it is. Ralph has a sword for his weapon and he can do some cool things. You can hold a charge shot that'll knock one enemy into others and it'll take them all out, kind of like dominoes. You can also do a downward thrust which is really fun and useful for killing enemies below you. There's also lots of stuff to collect, mainly fruit, that'll build up your score for 1-ups. Treasure is hidden just outside of the screen so it's worth it to scour each level as you never know what you'll find. This is a pretty nice game graphically. The levels are all loaded with bright colors and detailed backgrounds. The music isn't bad either and I like a lot of the different tracks. I really wish I had imported this game back in 1999 when it was released as it's another game that now sells for well over the $100 price tag. Again, I was able to download this game from the Japanese PlayStation Store and I'm playing it on my PS3. This is the easiest and cheapest way to play this game and it really is super cheap, only a couple of dollars. Do yourself a favor and download this title if you can, you won't be disappointed. Saturn Bomberman Fight is a really cool game for the Saturn. In this one you choose from a lot of different characters to play, but the first thing you're probably going to notice is that this takes place using an isometric view. Overall the weapons and tactics are very similar to your average Bomberman game, but with a twist. In this one you're battling an opponent and you both have a life bar. So it's almost like a Bomberman one-on-one -on -one fighting game, kinda. You also have the ability to double jump which is a really cool way to avoid bomb blasts. As I'm sure you can guess, your goal is to get the opponent's life meter down to zero before they do it to you. You can blow open boxes and objects to reveal special items. These can help you or even hurt you. For example, they can take away your ability to jump for a short amount of time. Or even worse, they can make your controls backwards. Now the control on an isometric viewpoint is already kind of goofy and having them backwards really messes you up. But the power-ups can also do good things like making your bombs blow up faster or laying three of them down in a row and other cool things like that. There's even a little horsey you can ride. It really is a blast to play, pardon the pun. When you get the big bomb, you gotta be careful to get away from the blast because you might end up killing yourself. I think most of the times I died it was from my own hand rather than what the enemy threw at me. There's also a multiplayer battle mode for up to four players if you want complete chaos. Unfortunately, Dave wouldn't play with me because he hates isometric games. Or it might be because I smashed his Game Boy in the last episode, I don't know. Nah, that can't be it, it's gotta be the isometric thing. There's also a survival mode where you just keep going as far as you can without continues. The play field is small and it can be kind of hard to make things out sometimes, but overall I think the game looks really nice. The music is really good as well and it's definitely worth listening to even when not playing the game. 
I have no idea why this game never came out of Japan, but it really should have. There's very little in the way of a language barrier here, and pretty much anyone can just jump right in. You'll only really be missing out on the story. Definitely check this one out if you like Bomberman. Nah, you're wrong. It's because you destroyed my Game Boy. What, well, it's not because of the isometric view? No. Would you have played it with me if I hadn't destroyed your Game Boy, even though it's isometric? Would you? I would have. Really? I hate isometric games, but I hate that you destroyed my Game Boy even more! Okay, okay, I'll try to undestroy it in the future. Okay, please. Anyway, <laughs> um, we've got five more, so let's just get right back into it. Here's Twinkle Tail, a run-and-gun game on the Mega Drive by Was. Was was a good developer, but Was wasn't meant to be, and as far as I know, they only released this one and it was a hit. I mean, I think it's a hit because I really like playing this game. I don't know the story, but looking at the opening cinema, it looks like a bunch of people lost some jewelry and a witch found it all. She asks you to return the jewelry to each person. The problem is that everybody that lost jewelry lives in a heavily guarded area. You need to kill all of their minions and return the jewelry to the rightful owner. So off you go on your quest. Luckily, you yourself are a witch and you know how to defend yourself. You have three different weapon types and each one can be leveled up three times. Using the right weapon against the right enemy will kill it pretty quickly, so be sure to try them all out. You also know two types of magic that'll be helpful along the way. You start the game pretty weak and only have a couple of bars of health. Each level you make it to adds one more piece to your health bar. The game is still fairly tough and you start out with only three continues. Don't worry though, as you earn another continue every 70,000 points and it doesn't take long to get there. The problem that some people might have with this game is that once you use a continue, you start at the very beginning of the level. I'm fine with that though, because the levels are all really fun. The stages are all well designed and some of them even have branching paths. I like that you can shoot your weapon in any direction you want, but I don't like that you can't strafe during a level. However, once you fight a boss, you will only be able to shoot straight ahead, so that's cool. The bosses are all huge and really cool looking. I like fighting this huge spider. He's large, menacing, and animated really nicely. In fact, the whole game is really nice looking and it has a great atmosphere. And of course the music is really good and I enjoyed most of the tracks in this game. I'm curious because I think this game was going to be released worldwide because the back of the box has pending patents in many different countries. But it wasn't, so be sure to rush to eBay and pick one up as it only goes for around $300 these days. Sure am glad I got mine a long time ago. The Laughing Salesman by Compile is another point-and-click adventure for the Mega CD. This one is also based on an anime, and this game features three episodes. We could have easily included this one in our WTF episode, or maybe even a Halloween episode. <laughs> it's messed up. Basically, Mr. Mogoru is a salesman who never charges his clients anything, and instead tries to fill gaps in their soul. If you ever see this creepy bastard, you run. You run fast and you run far. He will wreck your life in unimaginable ways just for his own amusement. Take this guy. All he has to do is walk down the street and women love him and men want to be commanded by him. Everyone thinks he's the most responsible person on the planet. But the truth is he only pretends to be confident. He also pretends to be able to hold his liquor when in reality he really can't. Enter the laughing salesman. Oh God. He offers a way for him to depend on others rather than to be depended on all the time. Our hero rejects the offer and goes home. The next day everything begins as normal, but his wife hands him one of the salesman's cards that she found in her pocket. Creepy. He gets to work and the laughing salesman is there to meet him. He insists on helping our hero and then he leaves. After this your wife calls and things start to get super stressful at work and finally he snaps. He just can't take it anymore. He sees the card and he decides to contact the laughing salesman. He arrives and then he tricks our hero into caressing a giant statue which basically reverts his mental state back into that of a baby. But that's not all, oh no. The laughing salesman goes, gets your family and brings them to see what you're really being cradled by. And that image is gonna torture them forever and destroy the family. Then he walks away, happy with his work and very, very amused. How messed up is this guy? 
Interestingly, you can make choices within the game that affect the outcome, so you don't have to end it the same way the anime did. You can actually get a somewhat decent ending if you choose the right path. There are three episodes to play through here, and all of them are basically 16-bit representations of the episode that they're based on. It's really cool how faithful they were to the original show while at the same time adding new scenes and choices. In this episode, you play as a guy who seems to have the perfect life, but he craves adventure. In the cartoon, he gets this disguise, but in the game you can choose your own alter ego, which completely changes the path you go down. And the third episode is about an illustrator who loves drawing and just wants to sell them, but he can't. Oh. The laughing salesman tricks him into getting stabbed in the arm so he can never draw again. In the game, you can come to a different ending, like getting arrested by the cops for an assault you didn't commit. Like I said, this guy is bad, bad news. Obviously, this game isn't very accessible to non-Japanese speakers, and that's a shame. A little bit of text translation and a whole slew of subtitles is really all it needs. <laughs> if you like creepy-ass Japanese stuff that loads pretty damn slow, then check this one out. Bones Adventure on the PC Engine was a port of the 1988 arcade game by Taito. You play the role of a Buddhist monk, how to do what, I don't know. Your weapons of choice are Buddhist prayer beads. There are four different types of beads and all of them have a different type of magic. You can power up these beads by collecting more of the same color and they become ridiculously huge but are really fun to wield. You use your magic by pressing down in the fire button. One of your prayer beads will flash and then do its thing. This is great and all, but there is a catch. Once you use your magic, the size of your prayer bead will get smaller. If you use up all the magic, you'll reset your beads to the basic blue shot. I found it more to my advantage to not use magic and just keep a powered up prayer bead. I like the atmosphere in this game. The graveyard in the first level is great. I also really like this bloody pond you're crossing where you're walking on hands and feet of, I'm, I'm guessing, dead people. Thanks for the hand. Oh yeah, I know, that was stupid. There's hidden stuff everywhere in this game, so fire at everything because you never know what's going to pop up and where. Most of the collectible icons are point related or have something to do with your bees, but every now and again something good comes up. At first I thought this game was really hard because one hit and you are dead. You get three lives per continue and Taito was super generous and gave you a whopping three continues. Thanks Taito, how very nice of you! I mean the game is still tough, but the more you play it and get used to how things go and patterns of enemies, it does become much easier and a lot more fun to play. To round it out, the game has a nice soundtrack that I really enjoyed. This is another great game that was left in Japan. But if you have a PS2 or an Xbox, then you're in luck because the arcade version of this game is included on Taito Legends 2. Ane-san is a beat-em-up for the PC Engine Super CD. The very first thing to say about this game is that all of your characters are women and all of your enemies are women. There are no male sprites in the game at all. I have absolutely no idea what the story is behind this game. According to the intro, I'm guessing maybe you were bullied as kids, but now as adults you're back to get revenge on your tormentors. I don't know if that's a real story or not, but it sounds cool. Anyway, you start by choosing your character and your stage. In the beginning, your character can only take three or four hits before she dies. And if she does die, she's dead forever and you have to continue on with the other two girls, both of which have their own unique fighting styles. Now, you don't have a huge variety of moves, but sometimes you can pull someone's hair again and again until they die. Every stage simply just scrolls to the right and there's always a mid-boss as well as the end boss. And these bosses are all extremely easy to defeat. Between the stages, you can buy stuff. I don't really know what any of this stuff does specifically, but if you buy the right stuff, your life bar is longer, your attacks are faster, and you even get more characters to choose from. And if you have room in your backup memory, you can save your game as well. And lastly, you can play the bonus game. Here you face off against another girl to see who can turn into a demon first, I guess? Why? There's only five stages in the game and overall it's pretty damn easy. Hell, you might even beat it the first time you play it. There really aren't a whole lot of different enemies. It's still held my interest though. 
Visually, the game is not very impressive at all. About a third of the screen is dedicated to the status bar for some reason, and most of the stages look very similar to one another. That's an interesting store back there. But the music, oh man, the music. It's a rockabilly paradise for sure, and I swear some of the music in Kill Bill sounds like it was inspired by this. It was done by Koji Hayama, and he's always churned out crazy music for games like Cho and Nikki, Front Mission 3, and many others. It's definitely a soundtrack that's worth ripping. Overall, the game is fun, but it probably won't be one you'll be replaying a lot. It was probably never brought out for the TurboGrafx-16 because of the all-female violence factor. Or maybe they didn't bring it out because they hated bringing over stuff for the US market. Yeah, I think that seems more likely. Do you remember Fortified Zone on the Game Boy? It's an okay game, but it has some control issues. There's also a game on the Super Nintendo called Operation Logic Bomb that's part of the series. It has a lot more depth to it and is pretty darn fun to play. But then there's Akari no Yosai 2, which is Fortified Zone 2 and it's on the Game Boy. It's the one game that didn't make it out of Japan and probably the most fun in the series. Surprise, surprise, once again, I'm not sure of the story here, and actually, I'm not sure there is a story anyway, since you get thrown directly into the game after pressing start. So the object of the game is pretty simple. You wander around a large area with multiple floors trying to find this thing. Once you defeat this thing, you're taken to the actual level boss. These boss fights aren't horribly challenging, but they are fun. Anyways, it's actually a lot tougher than I make it sound. To get anywhere, you need to search all over for keys to unlock doors. You can also open up paths by bombing certain walls or killing all enemies on a screen. You have three weapons to use, and you can switch between them on the fly, which is really nice. You have control of two people that you can switch to at any time by going to the map screen and hitting the select button. There are differences between the two characters. The man is slow, but he has a larger life bar. The woman has a smaller life bar, is a tad bit faster, and can jump. Her jumping ability is nice, but doesn't come into play much besides reaching a few areas around spikes. Once you die, you'll automatically switch to the other player. You'll do a lot of traversing back and forth and completing a level will take a half hour or more sometimes. My only complaint would be that I wish the map screen would show you which rooms have stairs. That's it, as I enjoy everything else about this game. It has some nice graphics for the Game Boy and it has a really good soundtrack that isn't annoying for how repetitive the songs are. Do yourself a favor and check this game out if you can. Alright, and here we are coming to a close of another Left in Japan episode. Yeah, pretty good one, I think. Uh, a lot of great games. <laughs> a lot of great games. The ones that you played, I honestly have never heard of most of those. Really? So, you yeah. haven't heard of Laughing Salesman? I mean, <laughs> I, that's like, like I, the household name. I guess oh, if, no. well, not in my household. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, those are some awesome games. And mm -hmm. watch episodes one through six, I mean five first. Yeah. And then if there's games in there that we haven't mentioned that you like, let us know. Yeah. And it, even if you haven't seen those episodes, be sure to tell us that we need to cover those games, yeah, even though we've yeah. already covered them. Right. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. And But I think we'll have enough games for a Left in oh, Japan yeah. 7 in the future. Yeah, now that I have a Japanese PS3 account, definitely. Yeah, cool. Anyway, what do you guys think of the games we covered and what games should we cover in the future? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. All right, Dave, let's, let's do that one game you wanted to do for the Famicom. Here's Nuts and Milk for the Famicom. A game where you milk nuts. Where the hell did they come from? Believe it or not, this is the first third-party game for a Nintendo system. This game is played on a single screen and is reminiscent of games like Bubble Bobble and Lolo. You play as a blob named Milk, and you need to rescue her from your nemesis, Nuts. Have you even played the game? I don't even, I've never heard of it until Dave just oh, mentioned it. Okay, I have Nuts, can you milk me? What?
Where are these guys coming from, dude? I don't know. What the hell, man? The goal of the game, as far as I can guess, is to collect fruit and free your girlfriend while avoiding enemies that nuts places around the screen. Every morning, Joe and or Dave get up, they put, grab a bowl, right? They pour the milk in, and then it's a bunch of dudes lined up around the lip of the bowl with their nuts just hanging in the cereal. Dude, I bet it's not even a real game. <laughs> and, they're, and they gotta sit there with the spoon, and they're like, they're slurping the milk with the nuts. Dude, are they... Are they gonna be doing that every time I say nuts? I don't even like milk, just nuts. I can't have this, man. This, I'm trying to do a serious it's, review it's, here. It's almost like when you stand in front of a mirror and you spin around saying Bloody Mary over and over and she's supposed to show up. I think when you say nuts, these guys just automatically show up. That's all, that's all we're here for. That's Pretty all we're much. good for is nut jokes. As you can see, it's not much to look at with a black background and minimal stage settings. But just because it doesn't look good doesn't mean that nuts and milk isn't a fun game to play. I think D likes it. Who's D? D's nuts. Oh! Dude, what is up with these guys? I mean, look at this. They, they've they got a ladder holding up a Super Nintendo sign. What? I don't know, Dave. If you want to review a game with nuts in the title. So when you're milking the nuts, is it is it practice, common practice to have said milk go into, like, your mouth? <laughs> See, they even interrupt me. Thank God Eric's not there. This thing would be freaking ridiculous if he was. If Eric was right here, our <laughs> output would be exponentially growing. I had a great time figuring out the best way to beat each stage, and before I knew it, the game was almost over. Nuts, nuts, nuts. Milk, milk, milk. All right, Billy and Jay, why don't you suck on these nuts, man? I've had enough of you guys interrupting our video here. Joe, I can't do this, dude. They're infecting the whole thing. Where, where are you going, Dave? You can't handle our nuts? I think they just do what they is. I'm going to pick another game, all right? Because nuts and milk is just not going to work. How about Bones Adventure? I mean, nobody can make fun of Bones Adventure. <laughs> He's a little boner. Hello and welcome to GameZack. This is the seventh installment of Left in Japan. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's hard to believe that this has gone on for so long. There are so many games out there. There are so many games out there and we get stuck with importing fees and shipping charges on all these cruddy games. Yeah. Not cruddy games, they're actually fun, else we wouldn't have bought them. Yeah. Anyway, let's just get right on into these games that we end up paying out the ass for. Extra. First up is The Game Paradise, also known as Game Tengoku on the Sega Saturn. This was originally an arcade shooter by Jalico, and they brought it home to the Saturn with great results. The interesting thing about this game is that it takes place inside a Japanese arcade and some of the games contained within. Supposedly, the story is about an arcade owner closing her shop for the day when she eventually somehow gets sucked into the games. I don't know if that's the case or not, but it doesn't matter because we're here to shoot things and die a whole bunch in the process. You select from a bunch of different characters, and you can tell just by looking at them that this is a cute em up Nothing wrong with that. Each character has their own unique shot and special attack. You can also charge your shot and release a semi-special attack, but I rarely found that this was worth the trouble. The stages are all great, with lots of whimsical scenarios. In one, you're flying inside one of those stuffed animal claw machines, and in another, over a racing game's racetrack. Or how about this stage? Do you recognize what game is being parodied here? Wow, you're pretty good. Okay, this one's a little tougher to guess, but not much. It's not Pac-Man. It's all pretty cool. There's lots and lots of voice in here, and not a lot of English text, so that may deter a few, but I think most people can figure their way around. In one area of the selection menu, you can get fake histories of the games that the characters come from. There's also several different versions of time attack modes, which are decently enjoyable. The game even offers what's known as a tape mode, where you prop your TV on its side so you can get the same resolution as the arcade game. This will give you a bit more resolution and detail, but honestly, I doubt many people would notice much of a difference. The normal view has bars on the sides of the screen to account for this, but no big deal. Like I said, there's lots of voice in here. One mode of the game has some chick talking a mile a minute about something. I don't know what she's saying, but she definitely seems excited as hell to tell you about it. Also, I love the sound of this character's special attack. There's even a special arranged mode of the game that you can play. This one features one more character to choose from, two extra stages, an extra boss at the end, and cutscenes between each level. It also features a proper ending since the story is more fleshed out here. But unfortunately, it drops the two-player simultaneous play of the normal mode and also the tape mode is gone. 
the extra stuff is welcome because even though there's six stages in the normal mode, they fly by pretty quick. But at least you get the blast of credits for some extra points. I love it when developers include little things like this. The biggest flaw in the game is that there are unlimited continues and it's really tempting to just keep going. You have to limit yourself if you want a true challenge. The graphics all do a great job though, they're nothing mind blowing. However, there's lots of scaling, rotation, and tons of stuff on screen with no slowdown or flicker. The music is hit and miss. Some of it's pretty good and the rest is merely acceptable. Combine all of this with very smooth control and you end up with a great game. It's pretty easy to see why the game never left Japan. Shooters were dying in popularity in the West and this one is also chock full of stuff that would make it harder to market to those unfamiliar with Japanese nerd culture. Still, I recommend it just as long as you can snag it for under 50 bucks. Just make sure that you feel comfortable navigating through the purely Japanese menus. Here's Nubo on the Game Boy by Iron. Don't you just love it when you play a game for the first time and the experience just sticks with you? Seriously, I played this game for about two minutes and I knew this was going to be a great game experience all the way to the end. And it was an amazing experience because I didn't stop playing until I beat the game. Luckily, the game is only about two hours long. I mean, Joe could have been at my house stealing all my games and I wouldn't have noticed. I was that engrossed. So this title is a platforming puzzle game. It stars a slow-moving creature that's very bulbous, but he is damn cute and does funny things like raising his hands when he lets himself up or down steps. And he also screams when he takes a daring leap off a ledge with a parachute. There's no enemies in this game, so you don't have to fight anything, and you don't die so you won't have to worry about falling off of ledges. Every item that you need to reach the end of the level is laid out right in front of you. All you have to do is figure out where and how to use these items. Most of the things that you pick up are easy to decipher, like blocks. Your character is a little too chubby to climb up or down bigger platforms, and he'll let you know by looking at you and shaking his head. But with these blocks, he can easily make a step to get where he needs to go. And some of the items, you don't know what they are, but all you have to do is try using them at certain locations, and then it becomes all too clear. I really like that you carry the items on top of your head. This frees up your arms for climbing up and down ladders and ledges. There's four levels in this game, and each one you basically end up helping somebody out, and that's how you reach the goal. Playing this game makes you feel like a good person for doing these random acts of kindness. Now if only you could be this good of a person in real life. Nah. The later levels do get longer and a bit more tricky with mazes, but they're not too hard to figure out. For a Game Boy game, I really do like the graphics. There's nice detail in the platforms and backgrounds when there are backgrounds. The music in this game is great. The tracks aren't long and will repeat a lot, but they have tons of feeling and all of them have a very catchy melody. Earlier I said luckily the game is only two hours long. That was a stupid thought because this game is really fun and actually I'd like it to be a lot longer than that. There is a password feature here in case you don't want to play through it all in one sitting. But just make sure that you play it no matter what. Gale Racer is an extremely early title on a Japanese Saturn. It was released in the arcades as Radmobile, and believe it or not, it was designed by Yu Suzuki's AM2, who is best known for Sword of Vermilion on the Sega Genesis. In the arcades, it was heralded as one of the very first 32-bit games. The arcade game also has the distinction of having the very first appearance of Sonic the Hedgehog in any video game ever, and he's just hanging from the mirror, flopping back and forth. Anyway, your task is to race from Los Angeles to New York. No rules at all. Whoever finishes first, no questions asked. Except that there are rules. For instance, you have a timer. If that runs out well, then it's game over for you. You have three continues to work with if you fail. Your view is from inside the cockpit of your car, and you can't change it. There are no other views. But you gotta keep in mind that this came out way, way before Virtua Racing and the like. Each segment is fairly short, and it's not one continuous race like, say, OutRun. Instead, when you get to the end of the segment, the game loads a new city. There's three segments in each area, and once you finish an area, it will tally up your times and let you know where you stand in the overall race. The controls are weird at first, and they do take a bit of getting used to. 
It's also hard avoiding the enemy cars. At least that's what it seems like. They're so huge and the cockpit takes up the entire screen, but you can pretty much drive through the sides of cars without slowing down much. I like all of the different locales in the game. Some places take place at night and you need to turn on your headlights if you want to see. Others take place in rain so you need to turn on your wipers. You never have to do both at the same time though, the game just wasn't powerful enough for that. Sometimes you even need to deal with oncoming traffic. The Rocky Mountain segment is just like driving through the real thing with slow ass trucks that you need to go around which end up knocking you off a giant cliff. I'm somewhat confused about parts of the route to get to New York though. You drive through Pittsburgh for a little bit and then the next segment is Washington. After that you go back to Pennsylvania in order to race through Philadelphia. The rules of the game are there are no rules so why wouldn't you just take the shortest route possible? Speaking of Washington, I don't really think that they captured the essence of the city at all, do you? There's also a time attack and a two player split screen mode if that tickles your fancy. The graphics are interesting. I know most of you think that this game looks like a horrible pixelated mess. Well you're definitely right, but I guess I can appreciate it for what it is. And it's a game that's made up completely of 2D sprites. The road literally looks like you're driving over a bunch of logs. It kind of gives the game a unique look really. Another game that AM2 would go on to make that used log scaling is Power Drift. This is the Saturn version and I wanted to talk about it in this episode, but it was just released in too many other countries on other platforms. I'll have to find some other reason to talk about it sometime. And no, it doesn't fit into the kart racing genre as there are no weapons and no attacks. I don't care what Wikipedia says. Anyway, I don't know how Gale Racer compares to Radmobile the arcade game. I assume it's worse since this is an early Saturn game, but I've never seen the arcade. The music is very cheesy, but I love it. I can see why this wasn't brought out for the Saturn and other territories though. They were really trying to push the polygon experience and it looked awful compared to newer games like Daytona. Only morons like me would have likely bought it. I can't really recommend it unless you have a soft spot for Sega racing games. If you do, go for it, it's extremely cheap. All right, cool. Three quality games right off the bat. I think so. Yeah, I really like that Game Boy game a lot. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's cool. Nubin, Nubin, Nubo, no, no bow. I don't know. I love I how they make listening. it easily pronounceable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've got three more games to cover, so hell, let's just get right back into it. This is Karoo and Squash for the GameCube. It's a puzzle game developed by Aiding and published by Nintendo in 2004. I'm not exactly sure how I found out about this game as I don't think it was advertised anywhere that I can remember. It doesn't really matter as it turned out to be a really good purchase. So as you can see, you control a stick that slowly spins in one direction. Well, it's not really a stick, but more of a ship and your little character sits right in the middle even if you can't see him. The object of the story mode is to maneuver your ship through tight corridors and reach the exit. It doesn't sound too difficult and the first few levels of the game are actually pretty easy. They're mainly wide passages with a few turns in them and they serve their purpose which is to let you get the feel for the controls. And speaking of controls, they're amazing in this game. The analog stick is very responsive and you'll have no problems controlling your ship. So besides just trying to get through each maze, you'll collect coins along the way. These coins can be used to buy things in the shop. I'm not exactly sure what all the items are since the dialogue is all crazy characters. I think the reason it's not in Japanese and has these characters is because I had to use a freeloader disc to get past the region lock. This somehow messed up a lot of the in-game script. Anyways, besides buying normal stuff like hearts in a Game Boy Advance, you can buy skins for your ship. Nothing in the shop is necessary to get through the game, but it would be nice to know what I'm looking at. As the game progresses, naturally it gets harder and the mazes become more difficult. Your ship spins at a slow speed, but you can slightly speed it up to help you get through tight areas. And if there's springs on the wall, you can hit them and they'll cause your ship to rotate in the opposite direction. This is all great, but the game doesn't ever seem to get tremendously challenging. This might be because you get three hearts. If you hit a wall or an enemy, you lose one heart, but it's never a big deal since halfway through each stage there's a spot that lets you refill your life. After every handful of levels, your ship will get an ability that helps keep the game fresh. There's four abilities and there are boxing gloves that let you punch enemies, a submarine which lets you dive underwater, a flamethrower that lets you fry enemies, and a tornado that lets you kill enemies with, well, yep, a tornado. 
There are boss fights and they aren't hard, but they can be entertaining and you only fight them when you have one of the abilities on your ship. Like I keep saying, the game isn't hard, but if you want to up the challenge, you can choose a bigger ship. This really does make the game more difficult as you don't have as much room to maneuver. I really do like the graphics in this game. The backgrounds are super colorful and nice to look at. I always feel like they'll be a distraction since you can typically see through the course to the backgrounds, but they never are. The music is a strange mix. Most of the time it sounds like elevator music, but it's not really annoying. It's nothing that I would care to listen to outside of the game, but it sounds fine here. I'm glad that I have this game, and if it looks like something that you'd be interested in, then give it a shot, you won't be sad. All right, here's Flying Hero on the Super Famicom by Sofell. I know what you're thinking. Another shooter? And another shoot 'em up? Yeah, so? Anyway, during the opening cinematic experience, we clearly see that this girl and her pet spaceship are having an argument of some kind. The pet spaceship or marshmallow or whatever it is wonders if apologizing will help make things better. And then for no reason whatsoever, the girl is kidnapped as often happens in video games and now it's up to you to rescue her so you can apologize. Honestly, if you actually manage to rescue her, she's the one who should be apologizing because this game is pretty damn tough. It puts a lot of stuff on screen at once with no slowdown and that means it's really hard to avoid getting hit hard and hit often. Initially, it kind of looks like a twin B game. You half expect bells to be flying out of these clouds as you shoot them, but no. The way the game works is kind of interesting. You can aim your shot left or right with the L and R shoulder buttons. If you press them both at the same time, you shoot directly behind you. And you'll need to master this to have any chance at all in the later stages. There's several different items that you can pick up. There's different types of weapons you can use, but collecting the same weapon icon again and again won't power it up. Instead, you need to collect cupcakes. Once you collect three cupcakes, your current weapon will be powered up one level. Each weapon can be powered up twice. There's also a cake-like icon which will power it up all the way. But you gotta be careful because if you collect another weapon, the power upness won't transfer over. Your life is also tied to your weapon strength. So if you take a hit, your weapon level goes down a notch. If you get hit when your weapon is at its lowest power, you die. Fortunately, you respawn right there. It's always good to keep two cupcakes in your inventory if you're at max weapon level. That way, if you get hit, you only need one more cupcake to restore your power. The problem is avoiding other cupcakes because you don't want to accidentally grab one. You can even get heat-seeking helper missiles that fire in addition to whatever weapon you're currently using. There's also bombs that you can use and collect. The screen gets crowded often, so bombs can come in quite handy. Like I said, this is a tough game, and I often found it hard to have enough patience to learn the patterns and keep going. And there are a ton of bosses and mid-bosses to learn over the game's seven levels. At least the graphics are bright and colorful, extremely bright. There's also copious amounts of scaling and rotation used via Mode 7. I also like that you get to destroy monkeys. And who the hell doesn't like killing monkeys? There's even some skeleton monkeys that flash you. Hey, look at me, I'm so naked I don't even have skin. The music is all right, I guess. I mean, it works for the game, but it's nowhere near the levels of Parodius or whatnot. So do I recommend this one? Only if you want a challenging shooter that requires a lot of patience to get through. Complete copies are going for more than $100, but at the time of this review, you can get a cart-only copy for around 30 bucks. Konami is known for some of the best action platforming games during the 16-bit era, and Gunbari Goemon for the Super Famicom is a shining example. Sadly, this game never made it out of Japan, and the storyline might be the reason why. From what I understand, a Westerner named General McGinnis wants to change Japan and make them follow Western ways and culture, so he invades the country with his bunny army. Yes, I said bunny army. Every enemy you fight has bunny ears, which makes them kind of cute, but it also makes me want to smash them. And smash them I did through many levels, and it felt great. To start the game off, you choose from one of three characters to play. Each one has a melee attack which can be powered up as well as a projectile. All of them are fun and they each have different attributes. I found Goemon to be the best since he's the all around best in stats. The game is set up really nicely with levels that are displayed on an overworld map that's easy to use. In fact, it's similar to Super Mario World. Once you get past a level, obviously you can go on to the next. There's towns that you can visit along the way which are easy to navigate. In these towns you can do a lot of different things. You can buy health and armor, which is usually necessary by the time you get there. You can stay at an inn and save your game. Staying at inns also refills your life, but it's not cheap. 
You might as well just buy food from another shop as it does the same thing but much cheaper. You can hit people with your weapon in town. But watch out because if you hit the wrong person they'll get mad and come after you. Just step into a shop and you'll be fine. Some towns even have mini games that you can play to earn extra money. A lot of them are fairly entertaining, like this one where you shoot balls at an opponent on the other side of a table. Or this one where you're cleaning up animal footprints in Mode 7. There's even a few cameo appearances here like Rocket Knight who looks good as usual but what the hell's he trying to tell me? And my favorite Simon Belmont who doesn't look as good as usual. I don't like Chibi Simon. Oh, and there's one more really cool thing that you can do which is play a level from that Konami shooter Zezix. Zzzgzz. Zzzzz. Whatever it's called. It's slow and feels really zoomed in but I'm really glad it's here. But visiting a town isn't the reason why we're playing this game so let's get on with the rest of the review. Every level you play is seriously fun and at times they can have some ridiculously hard platforming. There's even lots of little vehicles that you can take over from your enemies and use throughout the rest of the level. They're all pretty cool but feel a bit sluggish to control. The backgrounds are all really detailed and overflow with color. After a while you'll get to a boss fight. These are typical one on one battles and can be tough but once you learn the pattern after a few tries they get easier. Then there's the levels where you take control of impact. Impact is a huge robot on roller skates. The first part of these levels has you destroying small villages and enemy planes and tanks. So fun! Take that western culture! The last part switches to first person mode where you fight another large robot. You can punch, dodge and throw projectiles at your enemy. These battles are tough but like I said by the third or fourth time you'll learn what to do and then you can kick ass. When I started playing this game I was pretty amazed at all it had to offer from the different styles of play to the mini games. This is just one awesome game that didn't make it out of Japan. I'm really happy to have a copy in my collection and if it looks good to you go for it. You can get it for about $20 and it's well worth that. Alright, there's some more Japanese games for you. Uh, what'd you guys think about these games, Dave? What did you think? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's so damn funny? <laughs> Could we, well, said, I guess we know. What, what, you, what, what did you guys think about these games, Dave? That's what you said. I don't know what they thought about them. <laughs> <laughs> In the meantime, thank you for watching Game Sack. <laughs>
It's an action platformer based on the manga, and I know you won't believe me when I say this, but I've never read it. It doesn't matter though, as the Super Famicom got a fairly good game out of it. If you recall our PCFX episode, Joe reviewed a Zinky game called Zinky FX, which was definitely one of the best games for the system. Well, this one was released first, and I guess Zinky likes to be in good games. Anyway, from what I can understand of the story, there's this girl named Cherry who summons Zinky to save her. What he's saving her from, I'm not sure, but I guess it's all the enemies that you fight while playing this game. Duh. Zinky starts out as a small, spunky kid. He's fairly useless when you control him, as he can only punch and kick, and jump, of course. After he fights and defeats a boss, you get a cutscene. Cherry comes in and shows Zinky her panties, and all of a sudden he's big and has powers. Well, at least her panties appear to be clean, so that's good. Big Zinky takes over from here, and this is where the fun begins. At first, I had some troubles controlling my character. All of his actions feel sluggish, especially jumping, and I'd miss platforms that look like I should have landed on. But as I played the game more, I got used to how the controls worked, and I started to have a lot of fun. Big Zinky has a lot more going for him than the little guy. He has a bunch of attack moves that are hugely useful. He can do punching combos by button mashing. He has a cool electrical projectile thing. And my favorite is this tornado move. These are just to name a few. Another thing that he has in his arsenal is this nuke type attack. This attack uses magic that you collect and is displayed in the upper right corner. Upper right corner! It's so awesome because it does a ton of damage, but it's so bad because it takes a ton of your life bar. That's why you'll probably never use it. The stages are fairly long with lots of enemies to kill and even some hidden items in the hidden areas to find. As you make your way through a level, there's shrines for you to open which contain helpful items. Once you reach the end of a level, there's a force field blocking the exit. To clear the force field, you have to go back through the level to open all the shrines that have popped up out of nowhere. This might seem a bit tedious, but it's actually kind of fun. Yeah, you see a lot of the same parts of a level, but new pathways usually open up and it's up to you to find them. Once you find and open all the shrines, go back to the force field and it will open up and a boss fight awaits you. At first, the boss fights seem tough, but once you figure out their weakness and their pattern, they become absurdly simple. I bought this game from a friend a long time ago when he was selling a bunch of his collection. I picked up this box and the two screenshots that I saw I couldn't believe. <laughs> the graphics were beyond the Super Nintendo, I thought. I still think that as this game is stunning to look at. The outside levels have layers upon layers of seamless scrolling and it looks amazing. I could soak in these graphics all day long. It'd be easy too because the game has a soundtrack that almost matches the graphics. Lots of quality tunes that are very enjoyable and just enhance your experience. It's too bad that no Zinky games were ever brought out to the West. Even if the license was causing issues, they could have just changed the game's name and characters. Still, play this game if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Let's check out a Super Smash Bros. ripoff called Dream Mix TV World Fighters on the PlayStation 2. A lot of people suggested this back in our copycat game episode for its similarity to the Nintendo franchise. And they were not kidding. There's lots of different franchises in here. Hell, check out this crazy licensing screen. You've got up to four players battling it out all at once in what can really be best described as pure chaos. You have a decent roster of characters to choose from, including the likes of Simon Belmont and Optimus Prime. Oh hell, like I'm gonna choose any other character than Optimus Prime. Actually, I did try Simon Belmont, but he's only okay and it's easy for him to get lost in the backgrounds. In fact, I'd say the only two characters that aren't impossible to keep track of are Optimus Prime and Twinbee. I guess you can unlock Megatron, which is cool, but that requires beating the game with a whole bunch of other characters that really are hard for me to keep track of on the screen. Anyway, the premise is that you all share the same meter at the bottom of the screen. Once a character gets to the empty portion of the meter, they'll lose their soul heart or whatever it is and they'll shrink. If another character grabs it, then you stay small and lose the match, though you can still fight if it's a three player match or more. But you can also grab your escaped soul heart and grow back to normal size. That's pretty cool, I like that. Once you grab all of the enemy's soul hearts, you win the match. To me, this is less confusing than how Smash Bros. works with its weird percentages, but granted, I haven't really played that series very much. You only have a few different moves you can do. A punch, a grab, and a special. You can also do a special version of the punch move as well. The specials are fun and are, of course, unique to each character. Despite the simple controls, I wish I could say that they were more effective. Sometimes it feels like they don't register, but that might be due to the animation of each attack. That means your attacks happen slightly later than you expect them to. The visuals are a mixed bag. 
I like that each character has their own stage designed around their theme like Devastator here in Optimus Prime stage. I mean, Devastator is Prime's enemy, but he's still a Transformer, so that fits. Not sure why he's not moving, though. He should be trying to pound Prime with his fists. And everyone else, for that matter. I mean, he's Devastator. Anyway, the stages all scale out when the fighters get far apart, and this makes it really tough to see your characters because they are so tiny. Sometimes the characters even get hidden behind the bar at the bottom. This game doesn't support either 480p or widescreen, so that makes it even tougher to see what's going on. The music is also a mixed bag. It's mostly forgettable, but I do like some of the character themes like Simon's. The sounds are all annoying as hell. With as much noise as these characters are making, you think they're having a discussion instead of a battle. And they all have a lot to say. Each and every move must be announced. And does it seem wrong to anyone else that Optimus Prime sounds like a very, very angry Japanese man? Optimus Prime is not really a character that I associate extreme anger with. I imagine this stayed in Japan simply due to the licensing nightmare that would need to be resolved to bring this out anywhere else. Overall, it's not a bad game. I just think it could be better. Still, where else can you have Optimus Prime fight Simon Belmont? I mean, just for that, the game gets a thumbs up. Here's Getsu Fumaden or Getsu Fu Maiden for the Famicom by Konami. I'm not sure which spelling is correct as I've seen it written both ways. To me it really doesn't matter how it's spelled just as long as it's a solid game and a fun experience. When we went to Retropalooza in 2015, a fan of ours recommended this game and wow, I'm glad you did. Thank you, random GameSec fan. I can see your face in my memory, but I forgot your name. Sorry, bud. Well, I'll say it right from the start that this is a good game. Another thing that I'll say right away is that there is a fan translation out there. I played it in its original Japanese text and I made a really great start not knowing what's going on story-wise. After I played a couple hours, I kind of got stuck wondering what to do next. But it's still great fun despite that. Anyways, you start the game off on an overhead world and you basically just follow the path in the only direction you can go. As you make your way, you'll come across Japanese style gates. You can't get around these and once you touch them, you're transported to a side-scrolling action level. These levels are fun and are typically very short. Seriously, most of them take less than two minutes to get through. These levels are easy to traverse and are loaded with enemies and lots of platforming. Once you reach the end of these levels, you go back to the overworld map and continue on the direction you're headed. It's kind of set up similar to the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game on the NES, which preceded this with its overhead and side-scrolling levels. Anyways, these gates are all over the map, so get used to them. But don't worry, they're fun to play and your character controls really well, so just enjoy it. Probably the best thing about these levels is the variety in backgrounds and enemies. It's quite refreshing to see so much variety in each of these when there are so many of these levels present. So besides these action levels, there's other icons that you can interact with on the overworld. There's this hut looking thing where I'm guessing you get advice from a couple of different demons on what you need to do to proceed. This is really where I wish I'd played the English version. Then there's this other icon which is a shop. Just buy everything that you can in these shops because it'll eventually help you out. And if you don't have enough money, it's not a big deal. Just go back into any of the action sequences and you can farm money and health from the respawning enemies. If you find a good spot, then it won't take long to have thousands in gold. So just go back and buy everything you can. Like this shop here sells a sword and you'll definitely need it because in the action sequences it can break stones and walls so you can reach the other side of a level. Then there's a candle that you buy in one of the shop that is really helpful in the third person dungeon. The first time I stumbled upon this dungeon it was dark and naturally thought about the candle that I bought. Lo and behold it magically lit all the torches when I used it. The 3D dungeon that I played was slightly confusing and even though I found the end okay I still felt like there was something that I was missing. I went through it a couple of times but still left with an empty feeling. I'm glad to see these levels mixed in here and they do add to the fun factor. Sure, there's no smooth scaling and navigating can be disorienting with no map, but I still like the changing gameplay. This is seriously a good time from Konami. And to top it off, it has some really catchy music. The overworld tune stands out and there were many times that I would just let my character sit there without moving so I could listen to the music.
I'm sad that this never came out in the West and surprised Konami didn't bring it out under their Ultra label, or Palcom for you Europeans. Nintendo limited how many games each publisher could release in a given year. Maybe Ultra filled up all their slots too. We'll never know. Anyway, do yourself a favor and try this game out. Alright, we're back, and those three games were pretty good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm pissed off that some of them, like the Zanke, never yeah. came out in the I mean, U.S. Really? I mean, look at the graphics on that thing. Just beautiful to look at, and it's actually a pretty fun game. So, And we've got another game that I'm going to cover right now on the Saturn, mm -hmm. which also has really good graphics that most of you probably wouldn't want to play, but I think it's fun <laughs> anyway, so let's just get to it. <laughs> This is Nanatsu Kaze no Shima Monogatari for the Sega Saturn by Enix. Enix says this means seven blasts of the wind in island story. Seven blasts of wind, huh? It's almost too easy to make a joke out of that. The goal of this game is to uncover the seven different winds on this large, seemingly floating island. You're Gapu, a weird, fat, green creature with tiny little wings. You can't fly with those wings, though. You start out hatching from an egg, and you've already got a satchel around you. Anyway, you're left to figure things out from here. This is a 2D adventure game where you need to find and use items to access new areas. And there's never really a fear of dying or losing. There also doesn't seem to be a time limit of any kind. Just about everything here is in Japanese. You can use a walkthrough, but there is some text entry here and there, so you'll probably have to know a bit of katakana. You can use an online katakana guide, but the fonts in this game don't make it tremendously easy. Still, it's usually not a big deal, as all you really need to do most of the time is just press start to confirm what's already filled out for you. The menu system will definitely take a lot of getting used to, but once you understand how it's laid out, it's really not that bad at all. So you wander around from screen to screen investigating things and talking to other creatures. Eventually, you'll get a green horn. And you use this to wake up this giant ass dude here, and he'll give you a bug catcher. You wander around catching some of the little things that hop around and add them to your inventory. And if you give the giant dude the right creature, he gives you the blue horn. I'm assuming that each horn is one of the different winds, but don't quote me on that. It makes sense to me, though. Eventually, you'll have helper creatures following you around. Blow the blue horn, and this little blue dude will cut down the obstacles in your path so you can get by. This stupid purple dinosaur guy seems to have a big problem with me. He's always challenging me to stupid duels. Of course, I always win. He's also really cruel to this poor little rabbit-like creature. Poor guy or girl. And you'll run into him a lot at this part of the game. Eventually, as you wander around, you'll see that he tied the red creature up to a rock so he or she couldn't escape. If you use the blue horn, the little scissors guy will cut the rope and now she or he is your friend. Now if you blow the red horn, that creature will follow you around. It'll carry you over obstacles and you have a limited amount of flight to help explore even more. Overall, I think you get the basic idea of how the game works. It's divided up into chapters, and after each one is over, you get to read the story up to that point. Honestly, the game is pretty slow for the most part. You do eventually get the ability to run, but it really doesn't help speed things up much. This is a slow game for patient people, but seriously, that doesn't mean it's a bad game. Not at all. In fact, I enjoyed it quite a lot, despite the language barrier. The hand-drawn graphics are all amazing, and the animation is really cool, too. But at the same time, it can be kind of creepy. I mean, look at this weird ass face talking to you. There's not much in the way of music and even the sound is really sparse. Seriously, you might want to turn down the audio a little bit because the footsteps and stuff can get kind of annoying to listen to. It really is no wonder that this was never released outside of Japan. For one, it's not chock full of polygons. Also, it probably didn't help that Enix didn't support the Saturn in the US. And of course, no one else wanted to publish it because it probably wouldn't have sold very well. There's been some interest in the hacking community lately to translate this one, and it'd be cool if they did it. I can't really recommend this one unless you know or are learning Japanese, however. But I fit in neither of those categories, and I was still able to get some enjoyment out of it.
This is Robert Mondu for the PlayStation. It's the third entry in the Jumping Flash series of games. Did you know that Jumping Flash got a third game? I didn't for a long time. Anyway, I was a little curious as why it was called Robert Mondu instead of Jumping Flash 3, but after playing I can certainly understand why. The game flows nothing like the first two games. In the first two titles, there's a certain number of worlds, each with two sublevels in a boss fight. In this game you have a map and you can choose which mission you'd like to do, so it's a bit more free in that sense. You still control Robin in a first person perspective and he controls just like he always has and that's good. He can still shoot missiles at his enemies and he can still shoot a special weapon. The special weapon has been changed though. You only get one per level whereas before you could have up to three at a time and you could keep getting them as you play. So all is good with the controls but the problem to me is that the game doesn't seem as meaty. It doesn't have as much substance to it as the first two titles. It's not a bad thing but when you're expecting more of the same stuff that made the previous game so fun it feels like a letdown. I mean take a look at some of these ridiculous levels. This one has you jumping off a high dive, navigating through rings and landing on a platform. It's simple and very boring. Or how about this one where you're shooting a molar, whatever this is, to save a carrot patch. This level is a total snore fest but luckily it's over quickly. The game is loaded with filler levels like this and the bad thing is that you do them more than one time throughout the story. Granted things do change inside the level but you're still doing the same thing and it's just irritating. The game isn't all bad though and there are more than a few levels that feel like the older games. Levels that are wide open and you can traverse back and forth completing whatever it is that you're supposed to do. These bigger levels have different objectives. Like this one where you have to kill all the ghosts. It was as simple as can be since the ghosts don't fight back but I really enjoyed the atmosphere and the music. Another decently fun level is this one where you go down a well. It's a small maze down here and it's not even remotely difficult but it's still kind of fun. I really like the effect when you jump in and out of the water and again it has some decent music. There's a few other things going on in this game that I don't understand. You can collect and buy cards. What these do for you I have no idea but I feel that there's more to them than just collecting them. In the end do I hate this game? No I don't hate it but I am a bit disappointed at the end result. The first two games didn't sell like crazy in the west and that's likely the reason this one wasn't released here. But if it was released in the US back in the day I would have bought it since I really liked the series. Then I probably would have sold it as that's the kind of idiot I was back then. Oh well, I've played it and I'm content now knowing that I didn't really miss out as this game is fun but not amazing. Okay, this one is called Battle Zakaden and it's for the Super Famicom. I know, it's probably pronounced Battle Zakuaden, but I think Battle Zakaden sounds way better. Pronouncing Japanese words Spanish style is what I do. Anyway, this one is a single plane beat em up style game. You can choose from one of three girls, but it's only a single player game. Now, I'm not sure what the story is, but I assume some bad guys are around and it's up to the player maybe to save the day? Yeah, I'm gonna go with that. That's all you need to know. The gameplay is pretty interesting. There are some Street Fighter style moves that you can pull off that are pretty damned effective. You also have a magic move that's accessed by simply pressing the X button and it damages all the enemies on screen. These of course are specific to each character. And you've got a limited number of them so be careful. After fighting enemy after enemy you'll eventually level up. This basically extends your life bar and trust me you're gonna be needing it. This game can be tough because the enemies never stop coming. Granted, there's only ever two enemies on the screen at once, kind of like NES beat-em-ups, but they come quickly and they never seem to stop. You can also power up your magic which not only makes it stronger, but also lets you use it more times before running out. The stages themselves are pretty basic. Just keep moving to the right for the most part. Sometimes there's platforms you can jump up to and down from, and occasionally there's a bottomless pit you need to jump over. But honestly, that's about as complex as the stages get. Unfortunately, the stages are quite long and they get tiresome after a bit. Weirdly though, stage 3 is super short. There's not a huge variety of enemies and it can get kind of repetitive, but you know, that's par for the course with beat em ups. And if any of them can kick my ass, it's these pig guys. They are tough. And these guys with the hats usually hurt me when they first enter, but I get them quick enough. And what the hell, are they sending baby apes into battle? Fortunately, they're just as easy to defeat as human babies. Control wise everything feels responsive and there's nothing really to get frustrated about. Well actually there is a bit of slowdown here and there, especially in this level with fire. You can really feel it. 
The game looks pretty nice. The characters are all very large, and that's probably why only two enemies can fit on the screen at once. And don't get me wrong, I'm okay with that. I don't want to fight three at once, no way. Also, there's plenty of good use of color, and the scrolling is pretty nice in spots. The sound and music is, for the most part, pretty good. It's mostly an Eastern Asian style, and it definitely fits. In fact, I really like the theme in Stage 2. The sound can be weird sometimes though because reverb will randomly kick in here and there for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Wait 30 seconds and it goes away. I'm not sure if this is intentional or if it's just a bug. I'm also not sure why this game didn't get a simple translation and come out in the West. I mean it seems like it would be pretty easy to localize. I think it would have been a good addition to the Super Nintendo library. The good news is that as of right now, there are lots of copies available and they're pretty cheap. That's good because you really don't want to spend a ton on this one. Overall, it's a pretty good game if a little drawn out in places. All right, guys, there you have it, episode eight, and it is in the books. Indeed, it's almost over, but not completely over. Yes. We have post-credit skits. Yes, that they're not know. usually very good. Well, Including, some people like them. Well, they do, but they're, yes. you know, like the one for this episode is probably not going to be very good. Yeah, probably because we haven't even thought about it yet. That's true. So. <laughs> but anyway, well, it might be good. It's we'll not going to be good unless we think about it. You know, we're going to have to think about it after we're done talking. Yeah, so stop. But anyway... Uh, what, what do you guys think of these games that we talked about in this episode? Um, mm -hmm. You know, give us more suggestions for the next two episodes we hope to do yes, before yeah. GameSack fizzles into oblivion. Yes. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hello and welcome to GameSack. GameSack, yo! Anyway, this is Left in Japan. It's actually the eighth episode we've done in the series so far. Number eight! Number eight, yo! Anyway, we're talking about more games that have only ever been released in Japan, never anywhere else. No, man, nowhere else but Japan, yo! What the hell are you doing? Dude, I'm adding the two that people want in our show, yo. I suggest you get on the train. Think our show needs some two? Yeah, man, let's try it again. Okay, let's start over. Yeah. Hello, welcome to GameSack, y'all! Yo, GameSack, bitches! This is Left in Japan number... Eight!